everyone. Um, I'm Mayor Vi Lyles, and I now call the City of Charlotte's Council's business meeting for date of February 22nd to order. Today's meeting is a virtual meeting held in accordance with all the appropriate laws and statutes for requirements of notice, and all of those things have been met by electronic means. We hope that the public is watching and that you will view this meeting on the government channel, the city's Facebook page, or the city's YouTube page. I would like to uh, acknowledge that we will have two council members, jo three, two council members joining us around 4.30 and another around 5 p.m. And I would like to have introductions by those that are currently um, virtual, and then we'll have introductions of the staff that are in the actual facility, the government center. I am Vi Lyles, and I serve as mayor. Julie Eisel, Mayor Pro Tem, and serving at large. Dimple Ajmira, at large. Greg Phipps, at large. Braxton Winston, at large. Larkin Eggleston, District 1. Mr. Graham is going to join us at four, around 4.30. Ms. Watlington will join us around 5 p.m. Ms. Johnson will join us approximately 4.30. Oh, I'm sorry. I see Ms. Johnson right now. My yeah, apologies. Ms. Johnson. That's okay. Um, Renee Johnson, District 4. Good evening, everyone. Matt Newton, District 5. Charlie Picard, District 6. Good afternoon. Ed Driggs, District 7. Thank you. We begin our meetings with an invocation um, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. This invocation is by a council member intended to address how we manage and work together in our proceedings. And while we have religious diversity in our community, including those without a religious faith, um, we have actually um, take this moment to um, recognize the power that we have to um, work together um, through thoughtfulness. Um, today, I would like to ask everyone if they would um, bow their heads and we will have a moment. Father, Mother, God, thank you for the opportunity to join together during what can be considered a very difficult time for all. We acknowledge that there are many people suffering, whether it be by COVID whether it be by other circumstances caused by this terrible pandemic. But we also acknowledge the hope that you give us every day to wake up, to serve this community, to do our very best to represent the good in our city, the things that we can do to move people forward, the opportunities that you give us to serve as servant leaders. May you give us your grace and strength and power during this time of this meeting and our deliberations, we are grateful. We are grateful. Amen. And now we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance and the Mayor Pro Tem will um, recite the pledge for the full council. If you have the ability to stand and have a flag, please do so. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now we'll start with our deputy clerk and introduce the people that are in the room um, to help us during our meeting. Uh, Stephanie Bellow, deputy city clerk. Robin Byers, CDOT. Patrick Baker, city attorney. Tywood Jaioba, planning director, city manager's office. Uh, Dave Petten, rezoning program manager. Donata Jackson, office of constituent services. All right, thank you very much. Um, today we're going to um, do something. We're going to do our consent agenda items at the beginning of the meeting, and we're going to address any questions. Ms. Harris will join us at the podium to address that. Following the consent items, we will go to the zoning hearings, and we have 10 of those, and we will have one that has, um, I believe, objections to it. And then we will come back and begin with our um, action review and then go directly into our, um, we will do our proclamations after the action review and then go to our public forum. So is everybody good on the order for the day of the agenda? So with that, we have consent items. Ms. Harris, are there any questions regarding the consent items that are on the agenda today? 
No, ma'am, unless council has any at this time. Council members, are there any questions regarding the consent items? Are there any questions? Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Right, I'm approved. sorry. Can I wait, wait, Mr. I'm sorry. Don't get, give me, let me give you a minute. Give me a minute. We have one item that has been um, settled. So we would have the motion for items 23 through 57 with the exception of item 54. And Ma Mayor, sorry, since then we also have 41 and 42 have been settled and they'll come back um, on April 12th as well. So, so 41 and 42 will be postponed? And they, well, they're settled, yes, so they'll come back as the acquisition as well. Okay. In addition well, to 54. Uh, All right, we had, we had Council Member Eggleston make the motion, followed by Mr. Driggs. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, um, we'll start with Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham is not, er, has not joined us. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. All right, thank you very much. That's approval of the consent items as we have them here today. All right, the next um, thing that we're going to go to is our zoning agenda. And the first item that we have for zoning, hold on, let me get my speakers list. First item is agenda item number 54. Eight, um, petition 2020-083 by the Keith Corporation for approximately 2.4 acres along the northeast side of 5th Street. It's in District 1. The current zoning is office and multifamily residential with 43 units per acre. The proposed zoning is mixed-use development optional. Staff recommends approval of this petition. Um, so we'll go ahead and have, we have four speakers. I believe I'm I have these numbered in the 30s, but they're 58. Bridget Grant, um, Patrick Faulkner, Jay Banks, and Tom Grant Wright. Ms. Grant, I'm assuming that you will coordinate these, um, all of you speaking in favor. So we have, um, right now we'll have the staff presentation and then there'll be three minutes for the four and um, then we'll take questions. So, Mr. Petton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, 2020 uh, as mentioned, it's about 2.4 acres. It's on East 5th and Lamar Avenue uh, on the southwest side of Park Drive and just north of Caswell Road. Uh, existing zoning currently for the property is 02 uh, and R43 MF. The proposed zoning is uh, mixed use development optional or MUD O. Uh, adopted future land use for this project uh, comes from the Elizabeth Area Plan. It was adopted in 2011, and that plan does recommend office and residential for the majority of the site uh, and a portion uh, of institutional uh, on that corner of Lamar and Park. The proposal uh, under this petition is for three development areas, A, B, and C. Uh, development area A, which is on Lamar and 5th uh, back to Park. Uh, that's for up to 120,000 square feet of gross floor area for office and or medical uses with above, uh, excuse me, with below grade parking. Uh, on top of that, we're looking at 3,500 square feet of rooftop uh, event or gathering space with accessory rooftop outdoor space. Uh, we do have some limitations on hours of operation uh, within that proposal for that development area. Development area B would be for structured parking uh, up to 10 single family attached townhome units, either for sale or for rent. And then development area C. Uh, would be a minimum of 3,000 square feet of open space with improved landscape uh, and seating areas. Uh, we do have some limitations on residential uses for building height up to 55 feet, and then non-residential would be up to 85. Uh, we do have some optional provisions uh, to deal with recessed doorways, uh, some architectural uh, requirements, and, and also allow 10 by 10 site triangles. Uh, also, for uh, the, not to require the cell tower uh, on parking structure to be indiscernible. Uh, we do have some uh, transportation commitments along with this petition. Access would be on to East 5th Street, Lamar, Clement, and Park Drive. We do have an eight-foot planning strip and sidewalk uh, on all street frontages. 
parking for office uses would be provided at a rate of five per 1,000. Uh, we also have pedestrian crosswalk at Greenway and Caswell, uh, which would be subject to CDOT approval. Uh, in the event that that crosswalk would not be approved, uh, the petitioner would contribute uh, an amount equal to $40,000 uh, to the City of Charlotte for the purpose of a pedestrian improvement assessment, design, and or construction of sidewalk and or other pedestrian connections within the Elizabeth neighborhood. Uh, there's also some modifications to the signal at 5th Street and Hawthorne, and then some architectural building standards for both the office and townhome structures. Uh, you can see in the next slide, we do have some renderings uh, on the proposal for what uh, would be uh, potentially constructed on the site in terms of architectural guidelines. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have a few outstanding issues related to transportation and site and design to work through. It is consistent with uh, the Elizabeth area plan for the majority of the site. We do have that corner piece that's inconsistent that recommends institutional uses, uh, but overall the project is uh, generally consistent with the Elizabeth area plan. Uh, we'll be happy to take any questions following Ms. Grant's presentation. Mr. Patin, if you, uh, Ms. Grant, if you will hold for a moment, um, i just like to acknowledge that I should have done a brief overview that we are conducting 10 public hearings. We will have speakers, and speakers are allowed, as long as there's no opposition, to have three minutes. If there is opposition, each side is, has 10 minutes with two minutes of rebuttal for the petitioner. <coughs> In addition to that, I should have said that rec and recognize Kiba Sim Samuel, who is the chair of the Zone Planning Commission Zoning Committee, to, rec to make a statement about their next steps as they are our advisors in this process. Ms. Samuel. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Mayor Portem, members of council. I am Kiba Samuel, chair of the Zoning Committee of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Planning Commission. Joining us via live stream, uh, Facebook, YouTube channel, or the uh, government channel are my fellow zoning committee members, Aaron Barbie, Andrew Blumenthal, Peter Kelly, Elizabeth McMillan, Victoria Wasicki, Douglas Walton. This zoning committee will meet on Tuesday, March 2nd at 5.30 p.m. to finalize, deliberate, and make recommendations to council on the hearings being heard today. Um, that will not be a continuation of this public hearing. There will be no opportunity for public input unless and until a member of the zoning committee has a question or concern that is best addressed by a member of the public. Um, again, my name is Kiva Samuel, and I'm with you for the next hour or two as we go through these petitions. Thank you. Thank you. Again, my apologies for not recognizing you earlier. Um, so we'll now proceed with the speakers in favor of this petition. Um, Ms. Grant. Good afternoon, Mayor Lyles, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, members of the zoning committee. Bridget Grant with Maureen Van Allen, here today with Patrick Faulkner with the Keith Corp. Um, as you can see, there are a number of partners that have been working with us on this effort with staff and the Elizabeth Community Association after the last year. The Keith Corporation, in collaboration with Zilecki Real Estate, BBNM Architecture, Land Design, SGR Norma Wright, Design Resource Group, and Banks Engineering. It's difficult to put a year's worth of work into a three-minute presentation, so I'm going to start by thanking the Elizabeth Community Association for the collaboration and thoughtful participation over the past year in an end product that I think we're all going to be pretty happy with. Um, as Dave mentioned, we're seeking a rezoning to develop the site with medical office, accessory structured parking, relocation of an existing cell tower to another spot on the site, and residential uses fronting the park. As always, staff did a great job giving the plan overview, so I'm going to jump ahead to the plan highlights. The Keith Corporation spent a lot of time with us and did a good bit of preliminary outreach with the land use and development community for the ECA. Um, we knew it was important to get an understanding of the community priorities and opportunities. We recognized that it was important to have residential uses on the park, which also serves as a buff buffer to the structured parking. We're protecting some large existing trees along Park Drive and Lamar, and su subsequently creating this hidden pocket park on the corner and creating a signature medical office building that doesn't read like an extension of the existing hospital campus. We worked with the community and a different opportunity presented itself and we've spent the past month working pretty quickly to increase the height of the residential units on the park 
adding an access point on Park Drive and shifting from a townhome format to a four story residential units with four units on each floor. What this means is that ultimately we are increasing the number of units and again, changing the townhomes to residential stacked. So our building area where we originally had residential townhomes is gonna change just a little and expand to accommodate this different form. We'll be fine tuning this footprint over for our next submittal for the zoning committee. We've done some preliminary elevations to show what that new residential feature might look like. This is the front elevation. Again, we're still working through this. We've included a number of images depicting the character of the office. The site really doesn't have a back of house and a great deal of attention has been put into each elevation. Um, this shows basically our characteristic on Fifth Street, moving around on the structured parking and how we orient to the park. With that, I wanna bring it back to where we always start, which is how we check the box and show the benefits of conditional zoning. We've participated in a number of community outreach opportunities throughout this process, provided certainty on the development, limiting the uses, guaranteeing residential uses on the park, providing some certainty on the access, guaranteeing commitments on the materials, the orientation, and some overall public benefits with roadway improvements, the pocket park, and intersection improvements at Greenway and Caswell. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions. All right, I'm assuming that there are no other, the remaining speakers would be addressed if they, if they need to be called on. All right. Correct. Are there any questions for the petitioner or the staff? Mr. Eggleston. Mr. Eggleston. Uh, thank you, I was just going to reiterate what the said on this petition and actually the next one. In both instances, the petitioner has been working very closely with the Elizabeth Community Association um, there's a few small details around the edges of, of both petitions that the EPA has expressed to me they have confidence will get resolved uh, before we get to a decision potentially a month from now. Um, so unless there's other questions, I'll make a motion to close. Second, three. All right, we have a motion to close the public hearing as well as a second. Um, hold on if you'll give me a moment here. Okay, so with that, a petitioner, we have a motion and a second, ready to close the public hearing. Um, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Jo Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. All right, the next item is rezoning petition 2156, and it is item 59 in our books. The petition is for 2020-1656 by East Group Properties, approximately 38 acres located on the east and west side of Pinecrest Drive, north of Shopton Road. It's in the um, ETJ and would be nearest to District 3. The current zoning is single family residential with an airport noise overlay and the, overlay and the proposed zoning- Did we skip a petition? No. I'm sorry. I think we skipped one. No, we did, uh, that item was deferred last month. That would have been item number 35. That was deferred to March. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. All right. Where was I? Proposed zoning is light industrial conditional with the airport noise overlay. The staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues in transportation and some technical revisions. This item, um, Kent Main and John Carmichael, Greg Relsh and John Coleman have signed up for the three minutes on behalf of the petitioner. And we'll go to Mr. Patton for the um, staff presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 2020-156 uh, is just about 38.3 acres. It's off Shofton Road and Pinecrest Drive, uh, north, uh, or excuse me, east of Interstate 485. Uh, current zoning is R3. Uh, the proposed zoning is I1 conditional. Uh, both uh, present and future zoning would have the airport noise overlay uh, established on it as well. 
Uh, the West Side Strategic Plan, which was adopted in 2000, does recommend office, business, park, industrial land uses uh, for this site and the surrounding area. Uh, the proposal itself uh, is for up to 550,000 square feet uh, of uh, space, excuse me, over a maximum of three buildings on site. It does allow I-1 uses except for the following. Uh, and you can see there's a limitation on things like automobiles, truck and utility, trailer rental, uh, automotive repair garages, service stations, uh, barber and beauty shops, financial institutions, uh, eating and drinking establishments, retail, shopping centers, adult establishments, et cetera. Uh, we do have commitments to provide a five foot bicycle lane with a three foot buffer along the site's frontage on Shopton Road. Also has a reservation for potential future right of way uh, acquisition and purchase by the city for an 80 foot, 85 foot wide portion of the site that would be for a future uh, Shopton Road extension or realignment. Uh, we do have architectural design standards for materials for each building, as well as a minimum eight foot planning strip and six foot sidewalk uh, along the new public street and as well as along the Shopton Road frontage. Staff does recommend approval of this petition. As mentioned, we just have a few outstanding issues related to transportation and some technical revisions to work through. It is consistent with the West Side Strategic Plan uh, that does recommend office, business park, and industrial land uses for this site. Uh, with that, we'll be happy to take questions uh, following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. All right, Mr. Main. Madam Mayor, it's John Carmichael. We, we okay, Mr. Carmichael. Yes, ma'am. Um, may I proceed? Please. Madam Mayor, thank you, Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor, President, and members of the Council and the Zoning Committee. I'm John Carmichael, and I'm here on behalf of Petitioner East Group Properties. With me tonight are John Coleman of East Group and Greg Welsh of Oak Engineering. The site contains just over 38 acres and is located on the north side of Shopton Road at the intersection of Shopton Road and Pinecrest Drive. Next slide. Uh, the site is located across Shopton Road from uh, an existing office warehouse distribution business park. Next slide. Site's currently zoned R3 and is in the airport noise overlay district, as Dave said. Next slide. Petitioner's requesting that the uh, site be rezoned to the I1CD zoning district to allow an office warehouse distribution and light industrial business park. It would contain a maximum of 550,000 square, 550, square feet of gross floor area. Next slide. Uh, the request is consistent with the West Side Strategic Plan, and the site is located in the Shopton Road Industrial Activity Center, and once again, the Airport, airport Noise Overlay District. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, East Group is an experienced developer, owner, and operator of Class A office, warehouse, and distribution business parks. I'm going to show you a series of pictures of Steel Creek Commerce Park, which is an office, warehouse, and distribution park located to the west of the rezoning site at the intersection of Shopton Road and Steel Creek Road that was developed by East Group. Uh, this development would be consistent with Steel Creek Commerce Park, which you see before you a picture. Next slide. Another picture of the buildings at Steel Creek Commerce Park. Next slide. Uh, this just shows you the relationship between Steel Creek Commerce Park, which is highlighted in yellow, and the rezoning site, which is highlighted in blue. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, the site would be accessed uh, from Shopton Road and Pinecrest Drive. That portion, Pinecrest Drive is currently a private street. That portion of the site located, excuse me, that portion of Pinecrest located within the site would be converted to a public street. The site would contain three buildings. Um, Class A buffers would be located along the western and northern boundaries of the site. Uh, the two buildings next to Pinecrest would face Pinecrest. Uh, and the truck courts would be to the rear of all the buildings. We appreciate the planning staff's recommendation of approval, and we appreciate the time that the Eagle Lake residents have given to us during this process. I'm going to turn it over to Ken. If Ken's on. Ken, may I? I am here, yes. and, I am here and uh, just to say very quickly, uh, we're in the neighborhood of about 30 houses uh, at the other end of Pinecrest Road, uh, which is and our major concern through this whole process. We've been working with the uh, applicant and have uh, talked with him on a number of occasions based on the uh, uh, limitations of the use types and the proposed street cross section. I'm sorry, your time is up, Mr. Maine. Um, Mr. Maine, the three minutes are up. 
So we'll now go to questions for the petitioner or the staff. Are there any questions from the council members? I have no questions um, raised by the council. Move to close the public hearing. All right, Mayor Pro Tem makes a motion, a second. Second, Bakari. Thank you, Mr. Bakari. To close the public hearing, um, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Hashmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. All right, thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is item number 60, rezoning petition 2020-159 by Bainbridge Communities Acquisition 3 for approximately 14 point acres bound by the north side of Mallet Creek Road. Um, it's in District 4. The current zoning is single family residential. The proposed zoning is multifamily residential conditional. The staff recommends approval of this petition and we have the following speakers to speak to the petition. Um, Ms. Justin Houston and Alex Barsaro, and we will now have the staff presentation followed by those speakers. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 2021-59, uh, it's about 14.8 acres. That's on Beard Road, Ridge Road, as well as Mallard Creek Road. Uh, the property is currently zoned R3. Uh, the proposed zoning is for R22 multifamily conditional. Uh, the area plan for this spot is from the Northeast area plan from 2000. It does call for multifamily office retail uh, for the site up to 12 plus dwelling units per acre. Uh, just to go over the details of this proposal, we do have a proposal for up to 325 multifamily units and five buildings, uh, commitments for an eight foot planting strip and 12 foot shared use path along Ridge Road, Beard Road and Mallard Creek Road. Uh, access to the site would be from Beard Road. Uh, they would also have a right turn lane on Beard Road with 100 feet of storage to allow folks easier uh, access to the site. Uh, we do have an 11,000 square foot amenity area with landscaping, seating, hardscape elements, and shade structures, uh, sidewalk and crosswalk network within the, the project itself, uh, and then cap on limit our limitation on lighting to 22 feet, as well as architectural design standards uh, in regard to building materials, articulation, and massing. Just to give a little bit of context, if we can get back to the zoning slide real quick. Uh, it, you can see there's quite a bit of CC in the area. This petition originally started out as CC, which is commercial center. Uh, that, when we talked to zoning folks, was a less desirable outcome as it didn't necessarily meet the intent of what CC typically is. Uh, just to carry uh, forward, CC does... Uh, promote or, or allow things up to R22 MF. They're basically the same standards. So we had the petitioner convert to the R22 MF conditional. Uh, otherwise, we'd be looking at a, another CC type of zoning just to give you some idea of consistency with what's around it. So just wanted to go back to that real quick. Uh, for a staff recommendation, as mentioned, we do recommend approval uh, upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation, uh, as well as some technical revisions. As mentioned, it is consistent with uh, the Northeast Area Plan's recommendation of multifamily up to 12 plus dwelling units per acre. Uh, we'll be happy to take questions uh, following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. All right. Mr. Houston. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you all for your time today. Um, just wanted to... Uh, be here and attend. We don't really have a presentation. Staff did a great job on this one, um, especially with their review dealing with um, CDOT, NCDOT, um, as we're close to Mallard Creek 485 here and have some controlled access. So we appreciate their time and effort helping us get this turned around and getting us here today. All right. Are there questions by the city council members for the staff or the petitioner? We have no questions. Yes, I have a question. I'm sorry. Mr. Phipps has a question. Yeah, I noticed in the transportation summary notes that uh, some some road enhancements to the intersection of uh, Beaver and Mallard Creek will be undertaken as part of the TAP and the Vision Zero. Someone where needs to I mute find, their mic. Where could I find a, a description of what those enhancements will be? Yes, sir. We, we place those on the plans as well as the conditional notes that would be on RZ3. I believe you may be referring to the intersection of Beard and Ridge Road. 
Um, right. Be Beard and Ridge currently um, is a stop condition on Beard Road and a through condition on Ridge Road. Um, that was a comment that we had received um, through CDOT or from CDOT through their working with NCDOT um, to convert that to a three way uh, stop section or a, a stop section at all three uh, approaches to the intersection there. Um, there would be particular signage, restriping, um, and some minor reconfiguration of the curvature as Beard approaches Ridge. Um, it was a safety condition that NCDOT had asked us through uh, CDOT. Um, it's not going to be any kind of realignment of roadways, just a uh, signage and striping modification there with um, advanced warning detection signage ahead of time from Ridge Road coming from the south. So will these uh, enhancements be made, uh, will have to be made prior to any certificate of occupancy? Yes, sir, that is correct. Yes, they they were um, requests and we had listed them as uh, proposed improvements. Thank you. All right, any other questions regarding this petition? Hearing none, do I have a motion Move to close? To close Driggs. Second, Isel. All right, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Eggleston on the motion to close. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Ms. Ashmira. Yes. Mr. Phipps. Yes. Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. The hearing is closed. Let's go to item number 61, rezoning petition 2020-161 by KMJDH Beatty's Ford Road for approximately three-tenths or four-tenths of an acre located on the south side of Mount Holly, Huntersville Road. It's in District 2. The current zoning is neighborhood business conditional. The proposed zoning is general business conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition. And I don't believe that I, ha I do have speakers. Um, Walter Fields will represent the petitioner. So we'll go to the staff presentation now. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 202161 uh, is under 0.4 acres. Uh, it's on the south side of Mount Holly Huntersville Road. Uh, the shopping center just off Foxthorn and Beatty's Ford. Uh, current zoning is B1 conditional. The proposed zoning uh, is B2 conditional. Uh, the adopted future land use from the Northwest District Plan in 1990 does call for retail land uses for the site. Uh, the proposal itself is to allow a 620 square foot uh, EDEE with a drive through facility. Uh, does propose access off an internal private drive as well as screening along the drive through lanes and then all outdoor lighting uh, will be shoebox type to match the existing shopping center. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have some outstanding issues related to transportation and land use to work through. Uh, as mentioned, it is consistent with the Northwest District Plan. Uh, essentially, it's just a request to add that uh, drive-through facility uh, on that corner parcel of the shopping center. Uh, but again, staff does recommend approval. We'll be happy to take any questions uh, following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Fields? Madam Mayor, thank you. Uh, members of City Council, members of Zoning Committee, Walter Fields. Um, um, I actually did the zoning on this shopping center uh, many, many moons ago, and a new tenant wants to um, arrive and join the successful uh, collection of businesses. Um, this rezoning is required because the, the ED, the restaurant, does not have 50 internal seats and as a result, the ordinance defines it differently. And so the sole purpose of the rezoning is to permit this small ED to locate on this site. There were three items as listed as unresolved issues. We've actually already corrected our site plan to address all three of those, and we'll be resubmitting that in time for the zoning committee meeting. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Phipps. Mr. Phipps? Yeah, I was just wanting to ask Mr. Fields if he had liberty to disclose which restaurant is going to be? Um, Councilmember Phipps, uh, welcome back. Um, I don't know that uh, my clients have prohibited me from um, saying the name of the business. It's, a, it's a, actually a small coffee shop called Human Bean. I believe there's one over in Gastonia, uh, but this will be the first one in Charlotte to my knowledge. 
Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. Do I have a motion? Ms. Driggs. Mr. Driggs? I vote. Second. Thank you very much, Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Eggleston? Yes, and I hope for Mr. Phipps, the coffee shop has popcorn. All right. Um, Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes, and that was only a matter of time for Mr. Eggleston to say that. I know. I know. Ms. Edmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Uh, yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes, and I hope for Mr. Fields that his client is indeed okay with him telling us who that was. <laughs> I hope so. Okay. Uh, thank you. Me too. All right. Mr. Driggs? Yes. All right. The next item on our agenda is um, item 62, petition 2020-162 by Mountain Allen Promenade. Approximately six acres located along the northwest side of Smith Farm Road. It's in District 2. The current zoning is Neighborhood Services, Lake Wiley Protected Area, Proposed Zoning. It's Neighborhood Services Site Plan Amendment. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of um, specific um, issues related to transportation and technical revisions. The, we'll have a staff presentation followed by Keith McVean. Lawton Crow and Randy Smith, all speaking in favor of the petition. All right. All right. Thank Staff you, Madam Mayor. Staff presentations up. All right. 2020-162 is uh, just over six acres uh, in the River Bend Village Shopping Center uh, off Mount Holly Huntersville Road. Uh, the current zoning of the property is NS. We're looking at uh, an NS site plan amendment. Uh, we would continue to carry the Lake Wiley uh, protected area overlay on the property. Uh, the Brookshire I-485 interchange study from 2002 does call for residential office retail for this site. Uh, the proposal itself uh, is split into two development areas. Uh, we've got development area A1, which would allow up to 8,000 square feet of retail office or financial institutions, personal services, and EDEE. It allows only one use with an accessory drive through window. And then development area AP allows for the development up to 60,000 square feet of retail, EDE, general and medical offices, financial institutions, and personal services. That would allow up to two uses with an accessory drive through window. Uh, and then one uh, must be connected to a financial institution or retail use, and the other may be used for retail or EDEE uses. Staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of some outstanding issues. Uh, it is consistent with the Brookshire I-485 interchange study uh, that recommends residential office and retail. And again, staff does recommend approval and we'll be happy to take any questions uh, following Mr. McVean's presentation. All right, Mr. McVean. Good, uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of City Council, members of the Zoning Committee, Keith McVean with more Van Allen, assisting Mountain Island Promenade the petition with this uh, rezoning request. Uh, with me tonight and available to answer questions is Lawton Crow and Randy Smith. I want to thank Dave for his presentation. He's covered most of the points. We will be submitting a revised plan to address the issues, uh, the, the minor outstanding issues listed in the staff analysis. Uh, as Dave indicated, this is an NSSPA site plan amendment to a previous approval for Rivergate, for River Bend, excuse me, mixed use village shopping center. Uh, Corning Fibers uh, co corporate office is here relocated from Hickory a few years ago. Uh, this petition does not add square footage. It's basically to allow some additional flexibility uh, to, to, with some of the allowed uses to allow them to have accessory drop-through windows. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, those uses that were previously approved were restaurants, retail office, financial institutions, personal service uses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, along this parcel A1 is along Mount Holly Huntersville Road. The, it's a single building location, well, could be multi tenant. Uh, building configuration and size is, a, is identical to what was approved previously. Uh, the request is again to allow one use of an accessory drive through window on this, on this particular parcel. Next slide, please. Uh, this parcel is located along Highway 16. Highway 16 is to the left of the screen here. Uh, uh, Mount Holly Huntersville is to the top of the screen. Uh, this area has already been approved, or already has the right to do one bank with an accessory drive-through window. This petition would add a second and, uh, and allow additional flexibility for the, the, the previously approved bank drive-through window could be used for retail restaurant uses as Dave indicated. Last slide, please. In summary, this is a, a NSSPA really to create some more flexibility on 
uh, for the allowed uses that were previously approved, giving them some ability to uh, come back with uses that have accessory drive through windows. Be happy to answer questions. All right, are there any questions for the petitioner or the staff? No. We have no questions. Move Do to I close, Driggs. Second, Isil. Thank you very much. So this closing of this public hearing for petition 2020-162, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Let me go back. Mr. Newton, did I miss you? Okay, Mr. M Newton is not present for this vote. Ms. Ashmira? Not present for the vote as well. Thank you very Thank you. much. The next item on our agenda is item 63, petition 2020-165 by Taylor Davis for approximately Seven acres located along the south side of Mount Holly, Huntersville Road. The, um, um, it's in District 2. The current zoning is multifamily residential conditional. The proposed zoning is multifamily residential conditional site plan amendment with five-year vested rights. Staff recommends approval of this petition. And we have um, one speaker, Joseph Koss, Kass. Um, in speaking in favor of the petition. So we'll have the staff presentation followed by Mr. Cass. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. 2021 65, it's just under seven acres on Beatty's Ford and Mount Holly, Huntersville Road. Uh, the current zoning, as mentioned, is R8 multifamily conditional. Uh, the proposed zoning is R8 MF conditional uh, with a site plan amendment. Uh, they are requesting uh, five year vested rights. The North Lake area plan for, uh, is from 2008, does call for a portion of this site to be residential up to five DUA, and then a portion of the site uh, to be used for possible greenway uses. Uh, the proposal itself is for uh, 57 senior multifamily units in one building. You can see that outlined and uh, highlighted in yellow. Uh, we do have uh, commitments to construct a five-foot sidewalk and eight-foot planting strip along Mount Holly Huntersville Road, uh, and then Beatty's Ford, uh, uh, would get an eight foot planting strip, excuse me, and 12 foot multi use path uh, along Mount Holly Huntersville Road. Sorry for the confusion there. Uh, commits to road widening improvements to contribute toward a future four lane roadway on Mount Holly Huntersville. Also dedicates additional right of way along Beatty's Ford and Mount Holly Huntersville uh, for any potential improvements. Dedicates a 100 foot swim buffer and 50% of floodplain uh, to Mecklenburg County for potential future park and rec uses, uh, as well as a Class C buffer adjacent to the existing single family uh, and limitations on the height of lighting at 22 feet. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. Do have some outstanding issues related to transportation and land use. Uh, it is consistent with the recommendation for residential use for a portion of the site, uh, although it is inconsistent with that density recommendation of five DUA. Uh, also, it is inconsistent uh, with the portion of the site recommended for greenway uses. However, I think with the uh, dedication of buffers and floodplain to Mecklenburg County, uh, we do meet the general intent of that uh, land use recommendation uh, in the plan from North Lake area. Uh, so again, staff does recommend approval and we'll be happy to take questions uh, following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. All right, Mr. Cass. Hi, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Um, as you can see, uh, this is uh, located actually near the uh, Human Bean Shopping Center that was uh, mentioned in the previous uh, zoning request. Uh, this is a, a wooded site and the surrounding area would generally be described as wooded. Uh, there's a nicer, newer shopping center that we just uh, took a look at that has a food line and a CVS. And uh, there is another, um, uh, Walgreens and a uh, mile east down the road. I mention that because this is uh, intended for uh, to be age restricted uh, for households over 55 years of age. Um, so the uh, shopping amenities nearby is important. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as was previously mentioned, the current base zoning is R8MFCD and we're seeking 
R8 MFCD SPA, a site plan amendment. Uh, so the um, current uh, base zoning of R8 MFCD will remain in place. Uh, across the street is highway commercial zoning, uh, and the CVS is, of course, uh, B1 CD, and the corner parcel is owned by Piedmont Natural Gas and will likely remain undeveloped for the foreseeable future. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as was mentioned, the site is crisscrossed by some uh, water quality buffers and uh, creeks, uh, all of which will uh, remain undisturbed. Uh, the, the best quality uh, land to be developed is in the northeast corner, which is where the building and improvements will be placed. Next slide, please. And as you can see, uh, approximately half of the acreage uh, will be developed and a half the acreage will uh, remain undisturbed tree canopy, uh, which will preserve uh, the water quality and uh, protect those streams. And was mentioned, the site backs up to land uh, currently owned by Charlotte Mecklenburg, and it's going to be part of the Long Creek Pedestrian and Bike Greenway. And we're really excited to coordinate with the city and the county about connecting to that greenway, uh, which would be a fantastic uh, amenity for our residents. Next slide, please. This is a proposed rendering of the building. Uh, it is a senior building, as we mentioned, and it does have a pickup drop-off area, and the building will be served by elevators. Next slide, please. Uh, we're proposing 57 units. Uh, this will be all one- and two-bedroom units, uh, spacious units uh, with amenities, and um, Energy Star appliances, library, fitness center, um, that sort of thing. Next slide, please. Uh, this site will be uh, dedicated as affordable housing, and this is located in uh, what staff consider a high opportunity neighborhood. Um, the rents will range from uh, 500 to 1200 a month. It'll serve a range of incomes from 30% to 80% AMI. Um, the average monthly rent is $815. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, Mr. Cash, yep, your time, sure. is that the correct? Your time is up. We have three minutes for you, and I'm um, appreciated. I'm sure if there are questions, um, the council will ask you to follow up. Are there questions for the staff or the petitioner? We have no questions for you or the, or close, the staff. Please. Mr. Eggleston has a motion to close, followed by a second from? Second, Winston. Motion Winston. was by Driggs. I'm sorry, the motion was by Driggs. Excuse me, I thought I was Mr. Hurt, Mr. Eggleston. All right, um, the, on the motion to close the public hearing for petition 2021-65, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. All right, we'll go to the next petition, which is item number 64, petition 2020-165 by Hopper Communities for approximately three acres located on the west side of Bancroft Street. It's in District 1. The current zoning is general industrial and single-family residential. The proposed zoning, zoning is mixed-use development optional. Staff recommends approval of this petition pending outstanding issue, uh, resolution of issues related to transportation, site, and building design. Um, we have the staff presentation. We will be followed by Mr. Carmichael, Mr. Hopper, Ms. Clay McCullough, Nick Bouchon. Mr. Carmichael, I'm assuming that you will organize those three minutes. All right. With that, we'll go to the yes, staff presentation. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 202167. Uh, it's just over three acres. As mentioned, it's on North Graham Street uh, and Concordia Avenue. Uh, the current zoning is a mix of I-2 along North Graham Street uh, and then R-5 on the back portion of the site in yellow. Uh, the proposed zoning is for uh, MUD optional. The North Tryon area plan, which is from 2010, does call for residential office and retail for this site uh, with a density of up to 22 dwelling units per acre. The proposal itself uh, for this petition is to allow up to 73 townhomes. Uh, we do have an optional provision that the front stoop may be covered by an awning, canopy, roof extension, or other architectural feature in lieu of a recessed entryway. Uh, access to the site will be provided from Concordia Avenue uh, and Bancroft Street. 
Uh, we do have a provision for eight foot planting strip and six foot sidewalk along both Concordia and Bancroft, and then an eight foot planting strip and 12 foot multi-use path along the frontage of North Graham Street. Uh, internal ex external sidewalks uh, will provide pedestrian connections uh, to, throughout the site. Uh, we do have a 2,800 square foot commitment uh, for an amenity area, uh, a, a class C buffer adjacent to single family zoning, and then as well as a commitment to construct a new ADA compliant bus waiting pad uh, on North Tryon Street uh, provides a garage for each townhome as well as architectural features, uh, including some rear loaded units and covered stoops as mentioned. Staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of some outstanding issues. Uh, as mentioned, it is consistent with the recommendation of residential office and retail uses, uh, but it is slightly inconsistent with the plan recommendation of up to 22 DUA. Uh, this petition comes in at just over, uh, it's at 23.7 dwelling units per acre, so uh, just slightly over that 22 DUA recommendation. Uh, but staff does feel it, uh, uh, or does recommend approval, and we'll be happy to take questions following uh, Mr. Carmichael's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council and the Zoning Committee, I'm John Carmichael here on behalf of Hopper Communities. With me tonight are Bart Hopper and Clay McCullough of Hopper Communities and Nick Bishon of Design Resource Group. The site contains approximately three acres. It's located on the southeast corner of the intersection of North Graham Street and Concordia Avenue. Next slide. Please. Uh, this is an aerial of the site. Uh, next slide. And this is just uh, zoomed in a little bit. You can see Concordia to the north, Bancroft Street to the east, uh, and North Graham Street to the west. Uh, as you can see, portions of the site have been um, devoted to industrial type uses. Next slide. The current zoning is a combination of I-2 and R-5, the I-2 being in brown. Next slide. Hopper is requesting that the site be rezoned to the Moto Zoning District to accommodate up to 72 townhome units on the site. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, this is the site plan. Uh, the site currently is proposed to be accessed from Concordia and Bancroft Street. The townhome units adjacent to North Graham Street would front North Graham Street. Each unit would have a garage that would be accessed from the internal private alley and architectural standards are a part of the rezoning plan. Additionally, the ends of the townhome buildings that face Bancroft Street would have additional architectural requirements. Dave mentioned the central green. There's also a dog park to the south on the southern portion of the site as well as uh, visitor parking. Uh, we appreciate the planning staff's recommendation and we'll address the outstanding issues this week. Um, we had a community meeting. We had a, mo a meeting with Dru the Druid Hills community. And then last week, we had an additional meeting with um, uh, some residents on Bancroft Street. Uh, they had some concerns that we we're going to seek to address. And then uh, we will have a follow-up meeting with those residents. But we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That's our presentation. We have um, a question from Mr. Winston. Thank you, Mayor Lyles. Um, it's, it's less less of a, a, a question and just just a comment. Um, just looking at this petition, um, I, I find this to be very exciting. Um, it, it, this is going to this is the first um, development that I think we're going to see. That is going to be the first of many along the Graham Street corridor. Um, if you think about um, uh, uh, as we relook at the way we want neighborhoods to be built, there are so many opportunities uh, for people to live, um, work, and play um, very close to where they live. Um, but that's going to mean um, that this corridor is going to look very different, um, and I, I think very quickly. Um, so, so my uh, suggestion would be to the community to pay attention, get organized, and get involved. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention um, that this is a neighborhood that is very close um, to Druid Hills, um, and it's part of the Druid Hills community. And we lost um, a, a great leader um, and organizer in Daryl Gaston from, from this community. I'm sure we will talk about that later. Um, but it just highlights the importance of, of community members to continue to do the work um, and organize and be part of what is, is not just coming, um, but what is here. Um, and, and so um, thank you for, for, um, for presenting this. 
Um, but again, I, I hope the community just pays attention to the changes that are coming. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, Mr. Eggleston? Hey, Mayor. Um, so, to, to Braxton's point, my last conversation with Mr. Gaston was actually on Friday about this petition. Uh, I talked with him and Melissa for about 20 minutes on the phone about this, um, about 24 hours before we lost him, and I, I know we are going to talk about that later. Um, and he and others in these communities have done a good job of engaging folks and making sure that they uh, understand and aware of what's going on with rezonings and with, um, you know, our planning the future of Charlotte and making sure that those residents' voices are reflected in those plans and, and reflected in the decisions that are being made uh, about the future of their neighborhoods. Um, and in this case, I, I want to thank Mr. Carmichael. There was there were there were a number of people who live on Bancroft that were uh, some unaware, some unavailable to attend the initial community meeting that John had. Um, and when I brought that to his attention, uh, he was gracious enough to put on a second one for those people to be able to hear from him about what the plan is for this site, um, voice some of their concerns or, or their feedback. Um, those concerns largely centered around density, traffic, and displacement. Um, the density, I think, Mr. Patin acknowledged that the area plan here calls for almost specifically this exact amount of density um, for a corridor like Graham on one of these main sort of um, artery type streets. So I think that they mostly hit the mark there. John and I have talked since that community meeting, and I know he is working with the petitioners here to find some ways to address the concerns around the traffic um, and mitigate some of the impacts that that could have on Bancroft, uh, as well as make sure that we are doing right by the folks. Um, and I think there are three houses that would be eliminated to allow for this development I do think this begs, and this is not um, this is not on the developer. Um, I think this is on us to figure out how we build into this system a way to help protect renters in terms of if if an owner of a property decides they're going to sell it, that is a right they have as the property owner. Um, but oftentimes, I think we find that the property owner is maybe not being proactive in alerting the folks who might reside in a home that they own and they have decided to sell uh, of what their plans might be. And, and But for the fact that this had to go through a rezoning, um, and ultimately it ended up being the petitioner essentially who is alerting someone to the fact that the house that they rent might be sold. And I know John and the petitioner are going to work with us to make sure that these people uh, are able to to find um, other safe, suitable, affordable housing in our community. But, you know, I just wonder, and this is not a question I'm looking for an answer for tonight, but as we reimagine the rezoning process, as we do the UDO, as we do the 2040 plan, what can we do to try to encourage, if not demand, more transparency with landlords. Um, because I know that if, if someone just decided to sell and tear down and it didn't require a rezoning, um, who knows how late the game the landowner would have made the, the tenant aware of that decision that they'd made. Um, and again, that's not something that has anything to do necessarily with this petitioner. Um, they are trying to do right by the folks who live there. Uh, but it, it does beg the question of how we can try to do better in other situations to create that transparency and, and help folks who, just by the nature of the growth of some of these communities, will have to relocate. Um, but I do think that this is good project. I appreciate the petitioner's willingness to uh, work with me and work with the community to address some of the concerns that have been voiced. And um, 
So unless you've got other questions, I'll make a motion to close. Uh, actually, I see some, so never mind. Mr. Phipps? Yes, I had a, a question, just a brief question about density. Uh, it was stated that it's just slightly over the density of 22 acres, I mean, uh, dwelling units per acre up to 23.7. But another note here says that if this is approved, that it would go up to 40, 43 dwelling units an acre. I was just curious as to how could it almost double just with approval of this particular rezoning right here. I can, I can, I can get with Mr. Patine and, and planning to get a better understanding of that, uh, but yeah, the, I'm just curious about that. It would just be the land use recommendation. The, the project wouldn't allow up to 43 DUA, but in our land use categories, we have to amend our map accordingly, and we have to do that based on existing land use categories that we have. So the next one after 22 is 43. It uh, doesn't mean that this project would allow up to, it would still be capped at that 23.7, but in order to amend the land use map as a result of the rezoning, we have to go up to that next category, which is 43. Mr. Phipps, any follow-up? All right. Then may I have a motion to close item number 64? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I, I failed to recognize Council Member Johnson. Ms. Johnson? Thank you. If you can go back to the, the slide uh, with the map of Bancroft. Ms. Johnson, which slide from the from the petitioner or or this slideshow? Yeah. Okay, Wendy, can you uh, can you pull up the uh, slideshow from the petitioner? Well, that's fine. How many houses approximately are currently on Bancroft Street? Is the question for the petitioner or yes. the staff? That block, that the small street. Street. I'm My sorry, name. I couldn't hear you, Ms. Johnson, Ms. Eggleson. Did someone answer the question? Who is the question for, Ms. Johnson? Never can, it, it's my understanding that Bancroft is a very small residential street with um, yes. just with limited houses. Is there a is there a dead end on Bancroft Street? Yes. It dead ends at the bottom yes, of, of what you see on the map here. Okay. And when we say a small number of houses, do, is it less than 20 houses, 15 or 20 houses? So we're pro the proposal is to to add 73 townhomes uh, with entrance uh, off Bancroft Street. Mr. Carmichael? There would be, and yes, um, Madam Mayor, there would be, there are five houses on the east side of Bancroft Street, uh, and there would be, currently there would be two access points on Bancroft Street from this site, and then an access point from Concordia to the site. So they're, they're currently planned to be three access points, two of which are currently planned to be off of Bancroft Street. Okay. And do we know what the number of trips are for this proposed development? Mr. Carmichael? Um, um, so I do, I can answer it if you'd like me to. I'm not uh, trying to step please. on the toes. Um, so the existing use has 210 trips, the current entitlement 175, and the proposed zoning 400 trips total during the day. Um, there would be some widening on the site side of Bancroft Street along the frontage, Councilmember Johnson, but it would still be a two-lane road. I just want to understand. So it's 400 trips for a, a, a dead-end street with about with less than 20 houses. About if this if this project were to move forward, there would be a total of there'd be the church on the east side, and then five houses on the east side and then one home on the west side, okay. so a total of six. And is an entrance off Graham Street, is that a possibility for the development? Well, they were, I, I may have to refer to Nick Bashan. We had, we had one at some point and then it was removed. Um, Nick, are you on and can you add any color to that? 
Mr. Bouchon? Hello? Mr. Hello? Bouchon? Yes, uh, can you, I'm sorry, I had to step out. Can you please repeat the question? Mr. Carmichael, would you repeat there, your question? I'm happy to, Mayor. So, Councilmember Johnson asked us whether there could be an access point from North Graham Street, and what I said was there was one initially, but it was removed, and I just didn't know if you could add any context to that. Yeah, and, and really what it was, that was our preference, and it was gonna be restricted to right in, right out, and, uh, and to do so would create a center median, and that would have a lot of impacts with the existing industrial site and their access, being able to go left out across the street. So uh, we decided to move that, and, uh, and that, that was per discussions with CDOT and NCDOT, and, uh, and that's how you see the current plan now, funneling everything to Concordia with the existing driveway access. And I will say uh, our transportation team, we did analyze, uh, this actually just came in, that's what I was uh, uh, running to get, was the percentages and the breakdowns of the driveways. And uh, um, most of the traffic would be uh, that first right, LA access right off of uh, North Graham Street in Concordia. And then only about an estimated 15% traffic along Bancroft Street. So the majority of the users of the site would be using that first driveway closest to North Graham along Concordia Avenue. And then we're also analyzing additional uh, solutions uh, per our neighborhood meeting in addition. Ms. Johnson? Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Ms. Johnson? Any, any other, any further questions? Thank you. Move to close, Drake. Move to close. All right, Mr. Driggs, second by Mr. Eggleston. All right, Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Ms. Ajmira. Mr. Phipps. Yes. Mr. Winston? <coughs> yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Hajmira is not on for the um, vote for this item. All right, the next item is item number 65, petition 2020-170 by Sri Properties for approximately 0.26 acres with frontages on Downs Avenue and Shamrock Drive. It's in District 1. The current zoning is residential with five units per acre. The proposed zoning is residential with eight units per acre. The staff recommends approval and will present. Um, we have on this one um, two speakers, Russell Ferguson and Donald Storms. All right. Mr. Petten. All right. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 2021-70 uh, is just over a quarter of an acre. Uh, we have frontage on both. Shamrock Drive and Downs Avenue. Uh, the current zoning uh, is R5 residential. The proposed zoning is conventional R8 residential. Uh, the adopted future land use from the Central District Plan, which was adopted in 93, recommends single family uses up to five dwelling units per acre. Uh, because of the uh, age of the plan, we do uh, consider the general development policies, which would allow uh, up to uh, eight to 12 dwelling units per acre on the site. Uh, the rezoning from R5 to R8 is essentially, uh, if we can go back to the first slide, uh, is really just to establish two lots on this property versus just the one long lot between Shamrock and Downs. There are other lots just next door to this one that have uh, frontage on Shamrock and then a lot on the backside that has frontage on Downs Avenue. Uh, the proposed outcome for this would essentially be the same, split the lot in half uh, and allow frontage on both uh, one lot on Downs and then one lot on Shamrock. So even with the R8, we would still just be getting uh, basically one additional house uh, that on the lot that would front Downs Avenue. Staff does recommend approval of this petition. Uh, it is a conventional petition, so there's no uh, conditional site plan. Uh, as mentioned, it is inconsistent with the recommendation for up to five dwelling units per acre, uh, but it would meet GDP uh, for up to eight to 12 dwelling units per acre. Uh, staff will be happy to take any questions uh, following the presentation by uh, the petitioner uh, and uh, I think Mr. Storms. Mr. Ferguson. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mayor, Council Committee, um, thank you for allowing me to 
present today, uh, rezoning, as Dave just mentioned, is a really modest change to allow for an additional house to be built on the Downs Avenue side of this lot. It's a single family addition. As you go down that street right now, and you look around, you see when you come to this lot, you see what looks like a vacant lot. And, and there's a few lots like that left on the, on the street, but predominantly across the street on Downs, you've already had and Phil single family development come in on similar, similar width lots, similar depth lots. Uh, so we're simply taking about the most modest step possible to get to that. As Dave mentioned, it's conventional rezoning. Uh, we'll follow everything in code after that. We've got um, uh, comparable lot widths to everything there. And to put it in context, we're about, you know, it's this great uh, view from here. You can see how close we are to the plaza. Uh, this downs comes out between 34th and 35th. And, and you can even see, if you look at the top of the picture there, see the orange of the clay where there are now townhomes and other projects coming up um, as you get down 36th Street. So, you know, this fits the character of the neighborhood. Um, it was a little unusual, you know, to be here, you know, as a proponent of single family, but in this case, it perfectly fits the context and we hope you'll vote to approve it. There hasn't been any real negative feedback generally. We haven't done a ton of outreach because of the sort of modest nature of this. Uh, and I do understand that there's a little bit of opposition that has predominantly has to do with uh, some water runoff issues a, a few lots over from this lot. Um, and, I, and I think that's what the other speaker will be speaking about. And I'm happy to, to, to sort of respond to that and take some questions on the other side. Um, thank you. All right. I think how many minutes did he use? Okay. So you have, you've spent eight minutes. Do you have one of, have any comments by Mr. Storms? Oh, Mr. Storms is against, so I'm sorry. He will be next. Mr. Storms, um, you've heard the presentation by the staff and Mr. Ferguson, and now you have 10 minutes to speak um, why you disagree with this petition. Mr. Storm did not join the meeting. He did not join the meeting. I wish I had known that. I would have said three minutes and we would have been done here. <laughs> so I don't know what the rule. Should I give again the petitioner? There's no comment to make, so we'll just open this up for questions. Are there any questions for the petitioner or the staff? And Mr. Eggleston. Um, I'll ask maybe just the staff, if possible, connect with Mr. Storms um, to look at the stormwater issues that, that Mr. Ferguson mentioned. Um, I believe, if I recall correctly, that the, I don't know if it's a stream or a pipe, Mr. Ferguson can correct me, but whatever it is, the infrastructure that is in question there actually does not cross the lot that this rezoning um, is about. So it's it's a separate it's a separate issue that's not related to this rezoning, but it, we have had um, and staff has, has been great dealing with a lot of flooding issues in this area, uh, a lot of stormwater issues in this area, and um, so I, I hope that we can get someone from Stormwater to connect with Mr. Storms and his neighbors. But um, this petition is incredibly simple, makes a lot of sense, and um, there's no reason not for us to not move forward with it. But it, um, the stormwater issues there are real; they are just separate. So motion to close. All right, Mr. Eggleston has made a motion to close. Are there any other comments, Second, Mr. Driggs? Mr. Driggs? With no further discussion, Mr. Eggleston, on the motion to close. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? All right, the next item is item 66. Petition. Madam Mayor, I'm, I'm present. Madam Mayor, this is Malcolm. I'm present. Oh, thank you. What did, can, did you just join us, or have you? Been? Yes. Okay, Mr. Graham has joined our meeting, and so we'll move on to petition. Madam I, I, Mayor. Yes. Did you, did you get my? Yes. No, I did not hear your yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. I could not hear okay. you then, and, and so it just left it as an absent as a absent. So we'll just go to item 66, which is petition 2020-174 by MODCLT for approximately 
2.44 acres at the southeastern corner of the intersection of Norwood Drive and Parkway Avenue. It's in District 2. The current zoning is single-family residential, five units per acre. The proposed zoning is single-family residential, eight units per acre, and the staff recommends approval of this petition. And on this one, we have one speaker signed up, Brian Smith. Um, at following the staff presentation, Mr. Smith, you will have three minutes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 2021-74 uh, is just uh, about 0.44 acres on Norwood Drive. Uh, it's just somewhat adjacent to Parkway Avenue, uh, just one lot away. Uh, we do have current zoning as R5. The proposed zoning for this property uh, is for R8 conventional. Uh, be a single family zoning, no MF district, just R8 single family. Uh, the adopted future land use is from the central district plan that does uh, recommend five dwelling units per acre. Again, uh, this would apply GDP, uh, and in that sense, uh, GDP would allow up to eight dwelling units per acre, so it would be consistent with uh, the GDP's recommendation on this rezoning. Again, it is conventional. There's no site plan to discuss. Uh, staff does recommend approval. Uh, it is inconsistent uh, with that recommendation on the base plan for up to five dwelling units per acre, uh, but GDP would support uh, an increase up to the eight dwelling units per acre for the site. Uh, again, this would be all single family uh, detached dwelling units, uh, no attached would be permitted. Uh, and we do have some uh, instances of slightly higher density being appropriate on this corner lot. Uh, and then the extension of Stewart Creek Greenway, which is currently under construction, will also bring a, a connector trail across uh, Parkway Avenue to the site. So staff does recommend approval and we'll be happy to take any questions following uh, Mr. Smith's presentation. Thank you. All right, Mr. Smith. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor. I'm just here to answer any questions if there are, I won't waste any of your time. All right, are there any council members with questions for the petitioner or the staff? All right, hearing no questions, do I have a Move motion? Well, Mr. Driggs. All right, do I have a second? second? All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Eggleson, on the motion to close. Yes. Mr. Graham, on the motion to close. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Sorry. Mr. Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Yes. Ms. Mr. Graham? Yes. All right. With that, the motion passes. Um, our next public our next hearing is petition item number 67, petition 2020-178 by Teresa M. Orsini for approximately seven-tenths of an acre southwest of the intersection of Belmont and Siegel. It's in District 1. The, proposed, the current zoning is mixed-use development optional and industrial. The proposed zoning is mixed-use development optional and mixed-use development optional site plan amendment. The staff recommends approval upon resolution of outstanding issues related to site and building design and technical revisions to the same. Um, so we have two speakers for this item. Um, Russell Ferguson and Paul Pinnell following the staff presentation. Mr. Pesson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Our final petition is 2021-78. Uh, it's 0.7 acres on Siegel Avenue. Uh, also with some frontage there on the back end of McCadden Street. Uh, the petition and property is currently zoned MUD O and I-2, uh, the I-2 being the, the brown portion. Uh, the proposed zoning is for MUD optional and MUD optional site plan amendment. Uh, the uh, Belmont Area Revitalization Plan from 2003 recommends multifamily uh, for a small portion of the site in orange, uh, and then the uh, multifamily office retail for a majority of the site that's in the striped hatched uh, color on that uh, graphic, excuse me. Uh, the proposal itself is for up to 15,000 square feet of non-residential uses in the mud district. Uh, this would also include uh, the adaptive reuse of an existing structure on the site. It does prohibit automotive service stations and adult establishments on the site, commits to a maximum height uh, for any additions or new construction at 40 feet. Uh, we do have potential patio uh, use surrounding the primary building. 
uh, and notes that those areas may be utilized for outdoor amenities associated with EDE uses and or building expansions. Do have a couple of optional provisions uh, to allow parking between the street and the front of the existing building uh, and also meeting screening requirements by providing a green screen or living wall uh, with a minimum of three feet in height. We do have architectural standards uh, to prohibit uh, vinyl as a primary building material uh, and then full cutoff lighting for all new fixtures uh, except the decorative lighting may be provided. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have a few minor outstanding issues to work through, uh, a couple of technical revisions. Uh, it is consistent with the Belmont Area Revitalization Plan for multifamily office retail. Uh, that small portion that was recommended just for multifamily is where we have that, that slight inconsistency, but overall uh, the project is consistent with that plan's uh, vision for the property. And staff does recommend approval and we'll be happy to take questions uh, following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. All right, Mr. Ferguson. If we could go back to the first slide. There we go. Uh, Honorable Mayor, Council Committee, my pleasure to speak to you again in such close proximity uh, time. Uh, I'm excited to be able to bring this presentation with you um, for rezoning that is to save this building right here. We're, we're going to talk about keeping this building and not a new building to take the place of this one. Uh, and the cool thing about this, this rezoning is that this is uh, saving this old building and with the tenant coming in, it's gonna help uh, an existing area of business to stay in the neighborhood that they've already become a part of, even though they're being displaced by another development that um, you know, is, is moving on to bigger and better things, I guess. Uh, next slide, please. So why zone from mud optional to mud optional? Um, and, and the answer is there on your left, it's in teeny tiny uh, squiggly drawings, but essentially this lot in 2004 was rezoned with the lots across the street. Those are buildings A and B marked in red. They're not there anymore. Uh, the idea was to make it sort of an artist uh, area, had some very strict limitations on what could be done in this building, uh, and it never came to fruition. Um, and even my clients actually attempted to get it into a photography, photography studio, but ran into some hurdles with, with code and other things in the building that made it uh, not really economically viable. Our proposed zoning uh, does a couple of things in terms of uh, removing the restrictions and applying a little bit of flexibility so that this building and its parking can both serve to reuse this building and possibly help some other buildings that are right in the vicinity uh, by providing some shared use parking arrangements with them. And, and that's a big reason why we have so much space marked as potential parking, because we don't know whether those will come along or not. Um, uh, next slide, please. And I think it's really important to look at this. Uh, the, the area plan for this area is from 2003. Uh, the Belmont Community Association updated it. It's not a formal area plan, from my understanding, but uh, in 2016, these are some screenshots from their area plan. Uh, this building is a red building on there as a heritage building, and it's listed as something for to be repurposed as another use. Uh, it's in a section where they see a sort of the business section, and we're trying with this building to follow uh, the path of uh, Sweet Lou's Sweet Lou's um, Ace Burger Bar Recess, which is actually in my old Sunday school building uh, where Siegel Avenue Presbyterian was. Uh, we've been working with the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Um, this, if we have questions following up, I'm about to run out of time here, but we've, we've worked with the neighborhood to come up with these different areas so that we can keep the outdoor entertainment on the side of the building that is further away from single family. The contingent patio is really related to McAdden Street, if that were to become a real road or a uh, green one or something. So I'll take any questions you have. We hope you'll join us and support us and, and to avoid the awkwardness of the, the, the potential tenant. The tenant plan is a Bari Game Bar, which is currently located on North Davidson Street. Thank you very much. Mr. Eggleston? Russell touched on uh, all the key points there, but we're saving an old building and saving a small local business. Um, so this is a great project that's a great fit and I think is complementary to a lot of the other things that are going on in the Belmont community right now. So unless there are other questions, I'll move to close. Second. Uh, hearing no other questions, we have a motion by Mr. Eggleston to close, followed by Mr. Phipps with a second. Um, Mr. Eggleston on the motion to close. Yes. Mr. Graham. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. 
Ms. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes, and I'd add I, I love the company and we're lucky to have him in town. Mr. Driggs? Yes. All right, I'm going to go back. Mr. Graham? Ms. Johnson? The motion passes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm going to suggest it's 4.30. Let's take a 10-minute um, break. Um, is that too long for you guys, or is five minutes enough? Tell me five or ten. Ten-minute break, and we will start at 4.40 with our action review. The first item on our agenda would be redistricting considerations followed by a review of the ethics policy prior to it being on the agenda and the source of income discrimination update by the Great Neighborhoods Committee. 10 minutes to 440. Thank you very much.
Everyone, I'm calling um, the meeting um, of the Charlotte City Council business meeting for February 22nd. Um, we're going to reconvene at this time. I thought it might be helpful for the council to reintroduce themselves so as we continue this um, meeting from our zoning hearing. So I'm going to start. Um, I am Vi Lyles, mayor, um, serving as mayor, and then we'll just go to the next person on our list, Roster. Ms. Iso is not back just yet. Okay, so um, should we? Rick Phipps at large. All right, Mr. Phipps. Any other at large at members? Large. Are any other at large members Rick, back? Rick has been at large. Julie Iso, Mayor Pro Tem, serving at large. Larkin Eggleston, District 1. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Ms. Watlington will join us momentarily. Um, we'll go to District Renee, 4. Renee Johnson, District 4. Hello, Matt Newton, District 5. Sark McCarty, District 6. Ben Driggs, District 7. Has Ms. Ajmira joined us? All right. So we're going to begin um, our action review. We have um, three items. We will not have a closed session. Following those three items, we'll go to our recognitions and proclamations for the next part of our meeting before we go to the public forum. So um, I'm going to turn it over to the city manager for any overview or presentation that we would have for the action review. So thank you, Mayor and members of council. I will have a 30-day memo for you today. And consistent with what we've been discussing since the beginning of the year, we have uh, two or three updates for the action briefing, uh, two of which will be led by the legal department, and that is redistricting considerations and the mayor and council ethics policy revisions. Uh, both of these have come through the, gov the um, Budget and Effectiveness Committee. And then we have another update on the source of income discrimination which has come through our Great Neighborhoods uh, Committee. So, Mayor, with that said, I could turn it over to the City Attorney's Office. All right, Mr. Baker. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, City Manager. 
I'd uh, like to uh, discuss uh, redistricting with you. Um, some of this information has been presented to the Budget and Effectiveness uh, Committee, and uh, if we can pull up the slides. Okay, we can move to the first sl slide. Uh, what you have here is um, a map that has been produced by our planning department uh, that has an estimation of the Charlotte population as of 2018 uh, by the neighborhood profile area. And uh, the planning department has separated those into districts so you can see the uh, relative population of uh, the various districts uh, that we have here. By my back of the uh, envelope, calculation uh, it looks like the average uh, district and when you when you uh, put all seven of those together should be right around uh, 137,820 uh, uh, residents in in each district uh, would be uh, if you average them them out uh, and you'll see what appears to be the high end is uh, district 2 at a, a little over 156,000 and the low end is uh, appears to be District 5 at 121,000. Um, that looks like it's roughly 21 or 22 percent difference between uh, those two districts and that that issue of uh, the, the percentage of difference between districts will come up uh, later in this presentation but just wanted to wanted you to see that map um, if you haven't seen that before. Next slide please. Also wanted to share with you the uh, election turnout for Mecklenburg County from uh, 2014 to 2020. Uh, as you can see, and it should not come as a surprise uh, that in 2016 and 2020, the presidential election uh, years, we get much greater turnout uh, by population of, of the vote in Mecklenburg County. Uh, the midterm elections would be second um, in 2018 and 2014. Uh, you see in 2018, it was approximately 50%. 2014, a little less, around 39%. And uh, municipal elections, 15, 17, and 19, uh, you see those numbers uh, there uh, much lower uh, when you don't have the president on the ballot or the number of uh, seats that are typically up on the, uh, the even uh, the midterm elections, uh, 2018 and 2014. You see that you're averaging roughly 18%. Uh, uh, turnout uh, in the municipal elections uh, 2015, 17, and 19. Next slide, please. Uh, and you've heard a lot of in information about uh, the, the, the census data that's coming out, um, and it's coming out considerably uh, late, uh, which affects uh, various uh, local governments that have uh, true election districts, uh, because those districts uh, typically would need to be um, redistricted or rebalanced, if you will, um, uh, every 10 years after the, uh, the decennial census. Uh, and here we have a list of, uh, of all of the uh, uh, boards of county commissioners that have true election districts. Um, these, um, I don't think any of these districts are, are, are the, uh, these counties are going to be impacted by the census delay since their, their elections aren't until 2022. But you do see that Mecklenburg County is part of that group that has true election districts. Next slide, please. This is uh, the um, uh, city councils that have true election districts, and this is the one uh, that we're really uh, interested in. As you see, uh, Charlotte uh, is among, I think it's about 43 or 44 uh, municipal uh, uh, municipalities that, that are impacted in the sense that they have true election districts uh, that, that, are, that may have to be addressed uh, in this uh, 2021 uh, election coming forward. So you see that we're, we're in, a, uh, in a group that includes um, on the high end uh, Raleigh, uh, Rocky Mount, uh, and then there are some smaller communities uh, there as well. Next slide. And uh, this slide is uh, the local school boards that also have true election districts. Uh, and you will see that, um, um, I believe, uh, yeah, Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, is in uh, that group as well. And this could potentially come into play depending on uh, what the school board ultimately uh, elects to do uh, with their election, uh, which I believe is also in, in 2021. Next slide, please. So 
So we put together some timelines, and these are based on uh, the, the current facts as we understand them uh, and the current law that exists uh, right now. Um, typically, in, uh, by March the 31st is when we would expect to have received the census data. Uh, but as you know, uh, the, the Census uh, Bureau has put out uh, that the uh, results will be uh, significantly delayed uh, as late as September of 2021 due, uh, due in part to uh, the pandemic and uh, the delays that, that the pandemic has caused in the collection of this information. July 21 uh, is the date in which the council must adopt a plan uh, for redrawn districts. Um, and by law, uh, that plan has to be uh, put together uh, three business days before the filing period for municipal elections uh, for those district elections. Uh, so July 2021, uh, July 21 of uh, 2021 is, uh, is an important date uh, for us. That's really the drop dead date by statute by which uh, if we have to redistrict, we would need to have it uh, finalized um, so that folks can uh, make their, their, uh, their, their, their plans as it relates to running for office. Uh, July 26 through August 9 is the typical uh, candidate filing period is open. Uh, that's what we have uh, on, on the books for this year, if it was a normal year. September 14, the primary elections for the council districts, September and September 30th is, uh, is the uh, date that we expect the, uh, the information uh, that we would use to uh, rebalance our districts uh, to be released. Uh, we put that date in there so you see how much is already supposed to have happened uh, prior to actually having the information, the data that we would need to uh, rebalance uh, our districts going forward. Uh, and the rest of the schedule is the October 12th uh, primary runoff date for municipal elections and November 2nd uh, would normally be the, uh, the general election date. Um, just uh, also putting out uh, 2022 uh, key dates for the county, county election schedule, uh, which we'll come to in just a, a moment in terms of why that's important. Um, but for the 2022 election for the county, December 6th through the 17th, uh, 2021, is when the, uh, the filing period uh, opens for the county election primaries. March 8, uh, 2022 is the primary day, April 26 is primary runoff day and November 8 of 2022 is the general election. Next slide, please. So the key considerations, um, typically if we get the information from the census uh, in at the end of March, we've got three or four months uh, to adopt our, our redistricting plans uh, going forward for the 2021 uh, elections is how it normally uh, would work. And you see uh, the, the amount of time that we typically uh, have there. Um, each, uh, each census uh, period, when we get that information, uh, that's when you make the determination, A, if you have to uh, redistrict, that is rebalance your, your districts, uh, and, and B, um, uh, what that's going to look like going forward. So, so you'll get the question of yes, we have to, yes or no, we have to rebalance our districts. Uh, and then that information gives you the data that you need to actually accomplish um, the rebalancing of your districts. Um, the General Assembly may delay, delay filing deadlines. Uh, they have the ability to do that. And, I, and this is an important point uh, for us going forward. Uh, there's a lot of conversation that's going on between uh, the League of Municipalities, uh, the School of Government, uh, and the General Assembly. Uh, you all may be involved in some of those conversations as well in terms of what to do about this, this situation. I think it's on uh, everyone's radar now, although it's, uh, it was really just uh, some people, it did catch them off guard uh, in terms of uh, whether the General Assembly uh, needs to do anything and, uh, and what, if anything, uh, can they do to provide some, some potential relief beyond uh, the particular statute that's uh, available to us that allows us to uh, potentially push our elections uh, back to, uh, to 2022. Um, at this time, we don't know exactly. Uh, I know there have been a lot of proposals that have been put out there and floated out there. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we're in those conversations. And, um, but, but right now, I don't, I don't have a, a particular game plan in terms of what the General Assembly uh, may do, if anything, uh, as it relates to this issue of the late uh, receipt of the uh, census data. Next slide, please. So recommended next steps. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, the city does have uh, the, the option under uh, NCGS 160A 23.1. 
uh, to delay elections if uh, it appears that redistricting, uh, that we won't have the information that we need to have uh, prior to that July 21 uh, deadline to, um, to, to let folks know what the new districts are going to be. Uh, I don't see any uh, chance absent the, uh, the Census Bureau coming back and, and revising their dates uh, substantially. Uh, to suggest that we would have that information prior to uh, the scheduled opening of the filing uh, period for district uh, elections in 2021. And um, uh, that's just, you know, that, that seems to be where we are uh, at, at this stage going forward. So the idea of us, uh, the likelihood of us having an election in 2021, I think is, uh, is, is slim to none. Um, I just don't see that information uh, uh, being, being presented to the city. And it appears, uh, and that's why I led off uh, with the, uh, the map, uh, at least as of 2018, uh, it, it's, it's pretty clear that we would need to, to rebalance our districts. Um, some of the districts are uh, well beyond that, um, that 5% threshold. Uh, and that's uh, uh, something that's come out of uh, the case law, uh, this, uh, particularly the, the Stevenson case, uh, that, that basically requires that, that in these uh, decennial uh, redistricting efforts uh, that your districts need to be no more than 5% uh, uh, off of, a, of each other going forward. So you're not going to have a district that's 100% the, the, uh, equal, but within 5% is the, uh, is the rule of thumb based on the case law, and we're certainly uh, out of balance uh, as it relates uh, to that. And you see what we have here are our next uh, steps. Uh, at some point in time, the, if, if we choose to go forward with delaying our elections, uh, we would need to hold a public hearing uh, to do that uh, and then passing a resolution uh, delaying uh, the elections going forward. At this stage, I don't believe that we need to do anything specific right now, uh, but we will have to do something, I would say, by April or May if it appears that the General Assembly uh, isn't going to do anything, we would need to, to do something to take advantage of that opportunity under uh, 168.23.1 to delay the election. But I do think that we have some time to hear back from the General Assembly and kind of see what's going on. Uh, so I'm not recommending at this time that, that Charlotte uh, do anything um, uh, on its own, um, but let's uh, see what the General Assembly is going to do and to stay involved in those conversations going forward. Um, Assuming that we get the information um, in, uh, in September of 2021, we'll proceed to immediately start the process of uh, looking at our, our districts and, uh, and that balancing uh, process for, for the districts. Um, if we end up moving, and again, based on the current state of the case law, if we end up moving the election uh, to 2022, uh, you see the filing uh, dates or the proposed filing dates that exist right now of December 6, uh, opening up that candidate file, filing period for the 2022 elections, uh, and we're tied also to the county schedule of March 8 uh, with a general uh, election of November uh, the 8th of 2022. I know there have been a lot of questions that, that have come uh, to me, and I would encourage you to, um, uh, if you have a particular interest or want to know something uh, about this, this situation, please feel free to send those questions to me. I know I've gotten some questions about whether we've got the ability to bifurcate our election process, that is, move forward uh, with, in 2021 with the, uh, the at-large seats and the mayor's uh, seat, uh, and then go forward in 2022 with the district uh, seat. Um, our, the current state of, the, of our, our charter uh, doesn't seem to contemplate bifurcating uh, the, the election. Uh, I don't really have a, a, a clear answer as to whether we could do that or not. Uh, the concern that I would have is that you're potentially looking at three elections back to back um, if you wanted to move forward with, with uh, some in 2021 and then the rest in 2022 and then everybody in 2023, uh, the, the added expense of, of running back to back to back uh, elections um, may be uh, something to take into consideration. And I don't know if we have the, uh, the legal authority to bifurcate. It's not contemplated in uh, either the, uh, the, the current st uh, state law uh, of, of moving your election, uh, nor is it contemplated in our charter of how we do uh, elections. But this is a very unique uh, situation and maybe something that gets cleared up by the General Assembly. 
Uh, another question that I've, I've heard is the possibility of uh, a, a essentially a second three-year term. So if we moved, um, if we extended the election uh, from 2021 into 2022, that would effectively give you uh, this term a three-year term uh, and potentially in 2022 doing a three-year term that would get us back on schedule in 2025. Uh, again, the um, uh, there's nothing in the current state law that, that would allow us uh, to do that, but it is something that, that may be considered uh, by the General Assembly for communities like ours that have uh, two-year uh, terms going forward. That's a possibility, but I don't believe that we've got the unilateral authority uh, to do that going forward. A third question that's come up is whether um, a proposed uh, bond referendum or, or even a uh, an election uh, referendum could go forward uh, in the absence of a municipal election. Um, this is this comes into play as to what the uh, the school board's going to do because neither of those uh, referendums, uh, either a bond referendum or uh, the uh, the governance uh, referendum that we've discussed, could go along as a standalone item. Uh, they would typically be tied with some other election, either city, county, or um, or, or the school board uh, election. Uh, so uh, a lot of this may depend on what the school board uh, actually does as to whether or not we could add a bond referendum uh, going forward. So I'll stop there and take any questions uh, that you have. Um, before we I go to the next, to the council members, I just wanted to say that we, we were prepared and we were thinking about this. If you'll remember our governance um, Com committee recommended, you know, ideas that we should look at. We knew some of the issues around the legal decisions that we would have to make, and we were prepared. But the former administration of the census made it almost impossible to carry out what we thought was our plan. And the discussion today is to get everybody um, well informed. I think that's the most important thing is that we all understand the information. Um, I also think any questions that haven't been asked or addressed by um, Mr. Baker, I think would be really important to get out on the table. There's no action required of council tonight. It's a matter of um, continuing to um, work across not just our um, city and school board issues, but the General Assembly and the other communities that are engaged in this um, dilemma as well as Charlotte. And I, and I just want to say this, you know, it really in, was so important. When we appointed Mr. Phipps, there were 142 other people that really showed a strong interest in um, serving on our city council. And the idea that we have um, to make this kind of decision is just as important to those folks that are considering running for office as well as those of us that are currently serving. So I just want to make a point that um, we, we will need to continue to ask the Budget and Effective Governments Committee to um, keep up with this and to report back to us on a regular basis. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Driggs. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, I appreciate uh, the city attorney's excellent exposition of uh, all the issues here. But if I could sort of paraphrase, when we got the information a week ago Friday that we were not going to have census data until the end of September, what that did was completely take off the table any idea of trying to get an election done this year based on new districts. And at that point, what we were left with was <clears throat> either the thought of doing an election this year based on old districts or deferring. Uh, it was pretty clear that trying to do something based on old districts when we have a census and when the census data is pending would invite very serious legal challenges and was really not a place we want to go. So uh, the indication is pretty strong that deferral is really, and, and I believe the city attorney said this, is the way we're going to need to go. Um, the only thing I would uh, slightly take issue with is the primary responsibility for deciding about these things rests with us. So the possibility of an intervention by the, the General Assembly is a contingency. Uh, I would prefer, personally, that we move ahead with establishing what our plan is and make our intentions known and not wait to see when and if and possibly leave ourselves in a position of being pretty far down the road uh, and uh, finally getting uh, or not getting uh, from the General Assembly any instructions. So 
Um, personally, I think the, the, it is pretty clear where we need to go. And my feeling is that if we kind of uh, decided that we were uh, accepted the fact that the deferral is really what we need to do, uh, it might actually send a message to the General Assembly about our view on the situation and uh, uh, I, I think would be preferable. Um, I guess I just wanted to clarify too that uh, the, uh, <clears throat> actually I wanted to ask a question which is to the um, city attorney, if the school board does have an election and again, I'd like to just clarify, in case anybody knows, the school board runs on four-year terms, and they are staggered. So this year is the year that the district people run, which is why they have this particular issue. Uh, and if they decide to hold an election this year, and because they don't have primaries, it's not a partisan election, that is an option that may be available to them uh, and absolutely really isn't to us. But if they do, do we have a choice about whether to do our bond referendum now or later, or when do we have to make that decision? Uh, you, you would have a choice uh, as to whether or not you want to go forward now um, or uh, at another time. I don't have the, the timeline uh, uh, for that, but typically you would make that decision sometime in, uh, in mid-spring is when you typically make that decision to put something on the, uh, the, the referendum for November. And, and uh, I would note that particularly as it relates to our referendum related to the mobility plan, uh, given the steps involved there, as we know the timeline, um, uh, how, how does that play out in the context of these issues? Like we, we were thinking that we might get from the Board of County Commissioners the authority to put the tax increase on the ballot this year. Uh, uh, when do we have to decide about how we're going to handle that? Mr. Jones. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, Councilmember Driggs, I appreciate all the questions that you're asking. Uh, absent an action by this council or by the General Assembly, we are continuing to address the charge that was given to me and staff, which basically said to find a, a financing plan as well as a, a, a legislative strategy in order to have a one cent sales tax increase on the November. Uh, 2021 ballot. So I, I understand everything that you're saying, and I understand what the city attorney said and the, the likelihood of November of this year, but we must continue to do our assessment until there is total clarity. Mr. Driggs, um, as someone who cares passionately about that plan and the effort, um, I told someone today, I, th I was talking with Commissioner Altman and I said to her in my consulting days, it was go slow to go fast. And I believe so much in this plan and our growth and what we have to do to figure this out that I still take that position. We need to go slow to go fast, meaning that we need to work really hard on making sure that what we say to the public and the community will be something that we can deliver. And when we say that, that we do it with the trust and the ability to do that. So I think we have a sense of urgency around being informative and um, building coalitions. Um, the end result is success, but success only comes when you've taken the steps that are forward. So I say that with one of my greatest um, depths around this community, the way that our city and our county and our region will be successful as we see the growth and the kinds of things that are happening around successful communities like ours, it is to do something. To, to do three things, provide affordable housing, give people a good job, and the ability to move around the city efficiently. So let's, that's, I just wanted to say that it's because it's so very important for all of us. And, and Mayor, I was just saying that I thought it might be to our advantage to move quickly on the election timeline decision. Otherwise, I was just asking questions about, uh, you know, operationally, how our plans for a referendum in November are affected. I really just don't know how that works, frankly. Uh, I, I would note that if it is a school board election, attendance is likely to be very thin. And so we saw the participation rates for other elections. Um, we, we would probably want to think about how very light attendance at that election uh, might affect the outcome of the vote. But thank you. 
Thank you. I agree with that, but they're, but they're kind of independent of each other and yet dependable. I understand what you're saying. Thank you so much for that. Mr. Eggleston has a question or a comment? Um, a comment. I wholeheartedly agree with Mr. Driggs that the outcome of this as it relates to the council elections is fairly inevitable at this point. Um, to have the election with old lines knowing that we would without doubt be legally challenged, I think would be reckless um, and, and very ill-advised. The possibility of having the election this fall with redrawn lines, we've, we know with pretty much, with pretty good certainty as of last week, is 1%, probably 0%. Um, so I do think we're gonna end up with little to no choice in the matter, but I disagree with Mr. Driggs in regards to what Patrick said was, you know, we probably need to take action in April or so if we didn't get some guidance from the state level. Uh, and I, as our, um, I, I succeed in Mr. Driggs as our representative on the North Carolina League of Municipalities. I've had conversations with leadership there. They are having conversations with the legislature. I do think there's some value in us giving even if it's just a month or two, giving some time for a decision to be made because there are, as, as was shown on that chart, you know, almost four dozen communities who are facing the exact same thing we are. And I think that it will be a better solution for there to be something that can be universally adopted as a go forward plan on this for all of us, as opposed to us all doing it individually um, and, and separately. And I think too, no matter how much we explain all of what Mr. Baker just explained, to me, the optics of the council, particularly in February, voting to delay our elections a year will strike many wrongly, but it will strike them as us not wanting to face the voters or us wanting to extend our terms. Um, the fact of the matter is we, we have very little alternative to, to what Mr. Driggs and Mr. Baker just laid out there, but I, I think it will be widely misunderstood regardless of how much we try to explain it. And if there were a solution that involved the legislature proposing a path or proposing a plan for all of the municipalities like us, um, that would be better in, in a bunch of ways. So I, I hope that, you know, if we wait till April and nothing happens and we have to take that action, then we have to take that action. I think it's inevitable, but I do think there's a chance there could be movement for something to be done across the board. Uh, and I would be in favor of, of following Mr. Baker's recommendation and allowing a little bit of space for that to possibly happen. Um, and then revisiting this in April or so, if need be. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Eggleston. Mr. Newton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm definitely troubled by all of this. I think we we definitely want to to rebalance our districts to ensure that there's fairness in the representation that the the citizens of Charlotte receive. Uh, at the same time, and I think that that uh, our city attorney uh, m might have indirectly touched on this. Uh, that would, at the very least, and this is outside the context of going to any four-year terms or staggered terms, uh, would at the very least result in back-to-back -back election years uh, that could. Uh, certainly hamper our ability to get work done. Uh, I, I don't think it's, it, it's uh, you know, a secret that it's more difficult for elected officials to, to work in, in election years. At, at the same time, uh, you know, back in 2019, when the voters elected us, uh, there was an expectation that we would serve for two years and uh, thereafter uh, be held accountable. So whatever uh, decisions we may make uh, or, or, or in conjunction with voters made to uh, adjust the lengths of our terms, certainly in 2019, the expectation of every voter who went to the poll uh, was that we would only be voted or serve uh, a, a two-year term. Uh, so having said all of that, um, I, I, I do have great reservations and concerns here. Uh, I wanted to ask, I, I want to ask the city attorney a question because I, I'm, I'm really wondering if, we're missing a step in this process. Uh, I had the opportunity to review the statute, so 168-23.1. Uh, 
Uh, and that was actually a couple of weeks ago. And when I read that statute, let me be clear, too. The name of the statute is Special Rules for Redistricting After a Federal Decennial Census. So after the census. And the way I read that, uh, please enlighten me on this, uh, uh, Mr. City Attorney. But the way I read that, uh, it would suggest, and even the text of the statute would suggest, that we aren't, uh, as a municipal body, required to draw districts not every 10 years, but we're not required to do it until the, the census. And, and, and so I just was hoping for some clarification on that point. Uh, is it every 10 years or is it when we receive the census data? Typically. typically you receive the census data every 10 years and that's that's the the basis by which we talk about this this 10-year period um, but it is after the receipt of the, uh, the the data is the trigger for uh, looking to see if you need to uh, rebalance your districts and if so uh, to rebalance them for that next election which is typically going to be the the election ending in uh, uh, one in, in, and that's what would make sense to me, uh, because then, you, you know, the option for us to, to, to petition or apply for an extension uh, uh, is applicable, right? It, it, it's logical at that point. Uh, and I think the point I'm, I'm making <coughs> is, is it's not every 10 years that state statute would require uh, this council or any other municipal government to, to draw districts, it's simply upon the receipt of census data, uh, which typically would happen every 10 years, but does not necessarily have to happen every 10 years under the terms of the statute. Now, certainly, uh, you know, as, as Council Member Driggs was saying, the primary responsibility regarding what we want to do still lays with us. But I, I just wonder if we're getting a little ahead of ourselves a little bit ahead of ourselves if we are presuming that we have no option but to delay the election this year. Because under the terms of the statute, even if there's a legal challenge, I think, and I would ask for your opinion on this, Patrick, because, or I'm sorry, Mr. City Attorney, because you had also mentioned a 5 to 10% threshold in the in districts and the population within them, and us possibly, we don't know for sure, but us possibly um, uh, exceeding that. But even since still, under the plain language of the statute, it would appear that, that we would be well within the law, regardless of whether legal challenges are presented, well within the law uh, to move forward with elections. So if we so choose, because we would not have received the census data. And, and I, I, I will pose that question to you, uh, uh, Mr. City Attorney, uh, uh, to answer. At the same time, I would also, before I forget, be interested in knowing what the difference between, say, 2019 uh, numbers were and today. Uh, so uh, the numbers in as much as uh, the populations within each, uh, each district. But um, from the standpoint of, of that uh, original question, I would pose that to you. Are we talking about an additional overlay pertaining so regardless of the state statute pertaining to the 5 to 10% threshold. So just to be clear, the 5% the, the threshold is, is a product of case law uh, that has come out of North Carolina. Uh, that is typically uh, the, the rule of thumb when, uh, when you do that rebalancing of your districts uh, that typically occurs every, every 10 years. Uh, the challenge that we have here is based on the information that we've gotten from uh, the, the Census Bureau, uh, we will have that information uh, from them uh, to begin the, uh, the rebalancing uh, process prior to our general election. And we're also going into uh, this, uh, and again, the latest information that I have for you is 2018. I don't believe we have 2019 uh, data, uh, but, but at least as of 2018, uh, it, it was, it, if those were the actual numbers, it would show uh, that you would need to rebalance your districts going forward. So you're looking at the possibility of uh, if you stayed the course and, uh, and, and scheduled uh, 2021 elections of finding out in the middle of your process um, that the, the information that you have from, you, from the census suggests that our, our, uh, 
our districts are uh, out of line, uh, need to be rebalanced, and, and we have then chosen not to take this off-ramp, if you will, uh, that, that's provided in the statute. Uh, and, and the statute back in 1991 was created not obviously for a pandemic situation, uh, but it was created when there appeared to be a bit of a hitch uh, in the receipt of that uh, census data information from 1990. And that's why the statute was put out there to where if, uh, if uh, local governments didn't get that information in time to be able to complete uh, their rebalancing uh, process, uh, do, do the public hearings, et cetera, et cetera. It gave them the option, uh, if they so chose, to uh, to delay the election so that they could have a, um, a an election process that, that had a better chance of standing a uh, legal challenge uh, under the, the that, that one person, one vote uh, kind of uh, approach that that uh, a number of uh, municipalities have uh, have faced over the years uh, when they don't rebalance their districts. And I think what you mentioned there, Mr. City Attorney, about uh, the possibility of uh, the, the census data uh, being received in the middle of an election uh, this year is a very fair point. I, I just want to make sure that, that we understand, assuming my interpretation of that statute is not incorrect, uh, I, I don't... Uh, you know, I don't proclaim to, to know everything or, or say I always interpret statutes correctly. Uh, but, but assuming that it's not incorrect, I just want to make the point that we are not necessarily locked in to having, uh, having to, to delay the election this year. Uh, and uh, in, it, it did seem like that has been uh, within our conversation today and other conversations that, uh, that we've had that has seemed to, been, uh, seemed to have been the assumption. Uh, so, so, uh, so certainly, I'm looking forward to a continued conversation about this, and uh, and I hope we get it right. Thank you, Mr. Winston. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I just uh, want want to point out um, that you know, to Mr. Eggleston's uh, point earlier, um, I, I, I to go up to Raleigh to ask the General Assembly to change something that they have already established in law and, you know, and have considered, they have considered these, um, um, this situation clearly for all 43 or so um, municipalities that might, fa that might face this. I don't think there's any coalition building to get them to change the law. I think it's a clear that the law speaks for itself um, and there's precedent. This is not the first time uh, something like this um, would have had to been done um, in North Carolina. So the idea that we can go up to Raleigh to get a, um, um, a, a, a an exemption or or or, or to rally to, to to rally change in Raleigh, um, I think that is a political argument, um, and that's a political conversation um, that um, if if uh, 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 if citizens uh, groups of citizens wanted to get behind, that would make more sense. But I don't think we, um, uh, <laughs> I don't think it would be a worthwhile battle um, to, to, to go up to Raleigh with a political um, uh, a request uh, for a law that has, uh, that is clear, that, that, that is clear. Um, so I agree with uh, the steps that, that are laid out right here, and I, I would be comfortable uh, moving forward, uh, and it allows for the public conversation um, so that we can um, uh, 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 explain this um, and, and, and talk with um, our constituency uh, uh, to, to, to understand, you know, our role in this and, 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 and the legal situation that we, we face. Um, you know, the, I, I, I've seen some people say, have the elections, have the elections. Well, I think what you're, if we had an election um, in November under the current law, that election would be thrown out and considered unconstitutional. And the idea of, um, uh, of leading people on, I think is irresponsible and, and counteracts uh, the responsibility of us as, as elected leaders, not to, not to be political, uh, but to govern. Um, and, and I think that's what uh, we are being asked to, uh, to do uh, right now. Um, given the implications uh, that this has on, on families and individuals, as, as Mayor Lyle said, as people uh, decide whether or not uh, to enter into the democratic process, um, I do have a question uh, about uh, what could or could not happen 
um, should, uh, in relation to uh, the, the, the primary in March. Um, I would imagine that the county, uh, as well as the state, would need to redraw uh, uh, lines with new census data. Um, we also know that the county and the state do business very differently uh, than the city of Charlotte does. Um, I don't imagine the November 2022 general election is in any danger here, but I have heard anecdotally that the March 2022 um, primary could be moved as well. I, I would imagine this delay could impact the time. It would be because of the, the potential delay for uh, of, uh, uh, redrawing lines and, and the time period around filing in December. So do we have any visibility or vision uh, as to uh, whether that December um, filing date could be pushed back as well or and or what is um, the process for the state and county to redraw the lines uh, in time for that December uh, 2021 filing period? Councilmember Winston, the, the best information that I can tell you uh, as it relates uh, to the, um, uh, the filing periods and, and those primaries uh, coming up next year is that I, I have heard that there is some discussion about potentially pushing that back uh, given uh, the, the likelihood that some municipalities are going to be uh, in that discussion where, where they weren't going to be in that discussion uh, prior to uh, the delay of the, uh, the census uh, material. So, uh, I've heard that that's a, a possibility of pushing that back uh, to allow more time. Again, you're assuming that the information that we get from the, the census, as they're telling us in February, uh, is going to uh, be uh, available to us uh, on or about September the 30th. Uh, you're assuming no more slippage in that time as well. So uh, I don't know uh, what they'll ultimately decide, but, but that has been a discussion of, of potentially moving those, those deadlines back to, to create more time for municipalities in particular. Uh, but it also uh, creates issues for, for counties as well because they'll be under the same um, uh, push to, uh, to redraw their, their districts uh, to, to have them balanced uh, as well. As far as the state and, uh, and, and the county uh, process for redrawing, I honestly <laughs> have not looked at that. I've really been just focused on, on, uh, on Charlotte and, and municipalities. But uh, we, we will be in, in conversation, certainly, with our counterparts, with the county uh, and the school board as well, uh, to get a sense as to what they may be thinking about going forward. And we'll share that information as we get it. Yes, please. I think that's important for the um, entire context uh, for, for, for the public conversation. So if we can have that sort of that timeline that the county um, and state uh, usually uh, works with around redrawing of lines, that would be helpful. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll keep it brief. I would, I would have preferred to have the elections this year and to keep it on a two-year track. This does really... Um, does have an impact, but that said, I don't want Charlotte to be the one that gets out ahead and uh, puts our stake in the ground as to what we're going to do. Um, I think it's pretty clear, so we don't really have anything to lose by waiting for a little bit, but um, I just assume wait until we have, hear something out of Raleigh at least. But I would agree it's sort of a foregone conclusion. All right. Thank you. Um, Ms. Johnson? Thank you. I, I'd like to wait for the decision also. I mean, if we know that we're going to have to make that tough decision, we can be prepared to do that. But I'd like a little more answers from the city attorney, if we can get the information, such as what Councilmember Braxton uh, Winston asked about the county school board, the timeline. We also asked the question about the, I think the word is bifurcate uh, that you used, and you, you, you didn't have that answer. Um, and there were a couple other gaps in the information. So if we, if you could um, get us the information on, so we can make an, a full informed decision, um, such as can we um, bifurcate and have the mayor and, and at-large uh, elections or um, what you mentioned our charter. It's my understanding that we create the charter um, so if we could just get a full picture and what our options are and really have all of the information so we can make those decisions. Also, what Mr. Newton 
the, the questions he asked. So if we really, and that's all. I mean, again, we, we may have to come to, or we may come to the same outcome, but at least if we're making informed decisions so we can weigh the pros and cons um, comprehensively, that will be helpful for me. Thank you. All right, thank you. Ms. Ajmira? Thank you, Madam Mayor. So <clears throat> I'll keep my remarks very brief uh, because some of my questions have already been addressed by my colleagues here. Uh, but I, I would like Mr. Baker to address uh, the timeline. And I know this was something that I had asked at the committee meeting. What is the timeline that uh, Mr. Baker, you think General Assembly will take an action by on this, if any? So that way we have some time to look at what actions the General Assembly has taken and then uh, base our decision. Uh, I, I think right now I would like a little bit more time rather than just moving forward with this timeline. Yeah, and it's, it's my understanding that those conversations are going on right now. Um, and I'm assuming, you know, just the way that, that things typically move in the General Assembly, uh, that it may be six to eight weeks before uh, something bubbles to the surface, if you will, in terms of some thoughts and ideas that then uh, come together in some sort of a cogent plan going forward. So I would be surprised if we're not hearing anything from the General Assembly, if they're uh, planning on doing anything uh, different than what's available to us. I, uh, by mid-April, uh, and again, I, I know uh, uh, Councilmember Eggleston is on uh, the board of uh, La Liga Municipalities, uh, and obviously I'm involved um, on the legal side uh, with those conversations going forward. So I would think that uh, if something is moving along, I, that we would hear that things are being considered uh, or bills are being considered, uh, you know, it, it, as early as March, that, that something's going on, the conversations are, are being had. Uh, but certainly, if I'm hearing uh, from, uh, from my various sources that, that no one is interested in making any changes whatsoever, you've got a statute and uh, cities, you're free to do what you want based on what you've got out there when, when you want to do it. Um, I would think that I would have that information available uh, in the sense of I'm not hearing any progress um, uh, certainly in March. And, and that's why I had suggested uh, not necessarily moving forward, uh, particularly if uh, there is a comprehensive uh, plan that will uh, address uh, all the communities at once as opposed to, you know, the 42, 45 communities sort of doing, doing things on their own. Um, if there's a comprehensive plan, uh, we'll, we'll at least hear about it going forward because I, I think that we would want to have a, uh, a seat at the table and I would imagine that the General Assembly, uh, hopefully at least, would, would want to hear from uh, local governments as well. And obviously the League of Municipalities is going to have a seat at the table uh, as well. So if we are operating under that timeline, if General Assembly was to take an action, if any, uh, I think this could be a follow-up conversation we could have in end of March or beginning of or by mid-April as to what steps that council needs to take. Um, I, Mr. Eggleston uh, and Mr. Newton had said it very, uh, very well that this could uh, lead to perception issues. So I, I just want to, I just want to get the message out there that this is not something that council is prepared to have an election this year because that's what uh, we had all signed up for. But the census issue is not within our control. So uh, the perception issue of council having another year, um, it, it's, it's something that we do all need to actively address, uh, which means that there will be back-to-back -back elections in the following year. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's, and that's going to create a challenge when we have back-to-back -back elections. So uh, I don't know what other option is there out there right now without General Assembly intervening. So uh, I'm just not prepared to take an action as, as of right now uh, until mid-April. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sajmira. Ms. Watlington? 
much of what I was thinking has already been said. So I just want to lift up again uh, the desire for more information in regards to the options and make it very clear. We can delay everything. We can bifurcate. We can move forward as is. It will be helpful for me to see those options laid out and what the risks associated with each are. Um, I just want to make sure I understand two things. Number one, it sounds like if the county is already saying that March may need to be shifted for them, it would seem that this recommended April action where it says um, we delay until the 2022 elections, sounds like we're already not even sure that that recommendation is going to be plausible. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and yeah. That's, that's the challenge with this is that I'm trying to give you the information um, that exists right now uh, with the, the clear knowledge, and that's why I just want to make sure that everyone understands that, that some of the information that appears to be fact could also be changed um, mm -hmm. uh, in regard. So we're sort of playing this of, of, of this is what you have, and there's some potential changes that may occur uh, as well, and we're, we're, we're trying to just make sure that, that, that uh, all of you, as well as the general public, is, uh, is educated on, on what's going on, the decisions that are being made, and why they're being made. Okay. Um, and so what I take away from that, and I certainly understand that things are not in stone at all, so you're doing the best you can on that. I, so I got you there. But what I'm taking away from that is that this is best case scenario at this point. Um, and we may end up with a horse of a different color if we can't get the census information. But that leads to my second question that I wanted to make sure I understood. In regards, well, the second part of this question, when we think about our current plan or our current recommendation here before us, what we're essentially saying is delaying the elections, not from this year to next year, but from September to December. So the question for me then becomes, October and November, is that a realistic uh, timeline to be able to do redistricting? Like it's two months sufficient to actually do it. And if, if not, then I'd like us to think about what that looks like, because it sounds like obviously the county is already saying that's not realistic for them. So is it possible to start that any sooner? I understand we need the census data, but we also had this conversation when it comes to governance about adding a district seat, for instance. Those are the kinds of things that I'm wondering how do we use the time that we have in between to work some of those governance issues into this as well? because it would seem that we would have this issue and then immediately thereafter, we'd be addressing whether or not we'd wanna add a district, reduce at large or add another member of council if we wanna stagger. This would see, I would like to see all of those things kind of buttoned up within this work if possible. Yeah, I, that, I, that, that makes perfect sense. And, and I would say uh, that, that our office will certainly work with the administration on those matters. Uh, today was really just sort of a status report as to where we are right now. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think those questions about uh, the length of time it takes uh, to go through the redistricting process, uh, both from the administration side and also the, the public side in terms of uh, putting the information out and hearing from the public, uh, I think is something uh, that, that my office and the administration can work uh, together um, and, and uh, give us the opportunity to supplement uh, this, this presentation uh, with you all uh, in the very near future to have some of those other questions um, uh, answered if we can, uh, or at least put into a, uh, an, into a proper perspective. Thank you. Mr. Phipps? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, from a practical standpoint, I was wondering the impact of a possible delay would have on our council schedule in terms of, I know in previous election year, uh, years, we, we paused uh, rezoning hearings and decisions and things. Will they go on now as, as, as planned, even during the summer months? I would guess, I would guess, Mr. Phipps, that depending on how, how far this gets, um, we're going to have to just be flexible. But ordinarily, we would have our budget adoption take a couple of weeks to give everybody a chance to breathe while the staff gets all of that information out to all of the various suppliers, contractors, employee rewriting of payroll data and all of that. And um, we would come back in August or, or for this. But 
I think that what we've got, what we've learned is that we are not the drivers in this situation. It's going to be September 30th before the census data is released to us. And so I don't know that we have an action step to um, actually begin the work on redistricting until we get actual data. Making the decision, I think, um, will just depend. We'll need to be flexible and, and nimble on this one. For the summer, for example, if the General Assembly does something, if they do nothing, we need to begin to think about all of those steps that we have to um, follow through on. It's not necessarily ours alone from one perspective. There may be other perspectives about that. Mr. Phipps, did I, I, I probably muddled through that, but I think the summer schedule is traditional, um, but at the same time, we have to see where things are. Okay, Mr. Bac Mr. Bakari. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I would just add that uh, I have been in, in regular communication with our um, our leadership and other touch points in Raleigh in the General Assembly, and this is very high on their radar, um, as it should be. Uh, and one thing that gives me hope that um, the right answer is indeed what the attorney has laid out right now of letting the world turn a few times and seeing what happens is that um, while there are 500 municipalities across this state that do not have districts uh, and therefore this is not a problem for them in, in redrawing the lines, uh, we saw the 43 that do. It's not an urban rural thing. It's very much um, it's very much just a luck of the draw and several of the leadership members in Raleigh, those are their home municipalities. So this is as, as, as high of a radar item um, as can be on their on their to do list, and and I believe that um, they they will do something about it. They they will figure out a, a good statewide solution, and if they don't, they're going to let us know very soon. They're not going to wait around uh, to the last minute. And I, I'll tell you, I was communicating with um, one of uh, our colleagues in the Raleigh City Council who is on that list is doing through uh, is going through the same things we are, and they are actually nonpartisan. Uh, and they still don't believe there is even a plausible chance at time uh, in November for them to do the things they need to, even without requiring um, a, um, a primary. So I think this is pretty clean cut, which is based on the deadlines that we've seen uh, from the census, um, we, we, it is not humanly or legally possible to have an election this year. We need to um, continue to focus on the work at hand that's on our plates. Uh, and um, and the more we pay attention to it and try to solve for it now, the more we actually hurt ourselves uh, from that transparency and from that perception perspective uh, that we're worried about. So I, I think um, I think we'll, we'll moving forward in the way that's been designed right now is the right thing to do. If I can add to Mr. Bakari, if the, in the handout there are 40 municipalities, but I did a quick count and it's over 100 elected officials probably have boards having these same conversations and hopefully Raleigh does understand that because they live in hometowns just like ours but they also live with school boards and county commissioners so we're not alone in this um, absolutely and, and, and just I, I'd add some of the challenges again that that different topics and this is not a normal topic at all this is uh, you know a, a, a black swan type event. Um, some of the topics we have issues with rural urban right and things of that nature this is not that and in fact you know of of those 43 one of them is king's mountain of which the speaker of the house that's where he hails so everyone's thinking about this from the same from the same challenging aspect and this makes me feel like we'll figure this out all right mr graham uh, thank you madam mayor I, I i tend to agree and, and i hope that uh, along the way that we will keep this simple as possible and not make it more complicated than it has to be. Um, I, I think the attorney has really laid it out in terms of the direction that we need to go. I'm not sure that's, that was an, an assumption. I think he kind of stated factually uh, what we need to do from his legal perspective as our attorney, so I accept that. Uh, and I think uh, I'm not really worried about the perception from the public I, I think we sell the public short. They, 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 they kind of follow what we're doing and, and understand what's going on. Uh, and I don't think no one is, is saying that we want to add another year to our terms 
some people want to get out of here, right? <laughs> and so, um, so I don't think that's a problem, right? I think we got to educate and to communicate to the public, and that's what we're doing tonight. And so as, as simple as we can make this so they can digest it and understand, I think it would be uh, in the best interest of the public. And then secondly, I do agree, maybe 30 days to kind of see what the General Assembly does. And then after that, I think it's really important that we, we kind of make a leadership decision here in Charlotte. So those who are planning on running um, for uh, city council this year can know how to make their plans, whether to plan for a, a, a um, Ju July uh, opening day, which is not likely, or sometime later in the year. So I just think we just need to keep it simple, communicate and educate, and just see what happens over the next 30 days. Thank you. All right. I think that's our last speaker. So um, thanks to everyone. This is this is hard work. Oh, I'm sorry. Do I have another hand up? I I had my hand up again. For Who a is this, time. Mr. Newton? That's Mr. Newton. Mr. Newton, I'm sorry. I didn't. I've got a board here, and it didn't have your name on it. But let's go, Mr. Newton. I'm recognizing you now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so I uh, I would agree that it would be very helpful if the General Assembly were to weigh in on this. Uh, at the same time, uh, I would be interested in the same information that Council Member uh, Wadlington had asked for uh, a timeline uh, uh, of of what we would be looking at from the standpoint of when elections would occur based upon when we would receive uh, census data, uh, as well as what our options are. So what the options are and uh, what are the possible consequences. Um, I, I do want to make sure that we are honest with the public and we aren't disseminating anything that's dishonest or that we truly don't know. And so that's why I still uh, have a concern with us saying that, just outright saying that moving forward would be unconstitutional. Uh, I don't think at this point in time we really know that. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because there is an option here, right? State statute creates an option. It's not a, it's not a mandate, it's an option to allow us to uh, unilaterally, uh, well, to apply, unilaterally apply to delay a year. What's the other option to move forward? Right. So I I don't know if, if that statute. So it wouldn't necessarily be our decision. It would be whether the statute is unconstitutional. I don't know if that's ever been challenged. I, I would say that that, you know, every year separated from a census creates deviation from that census. And so if we're saying simply because there is deviation and I don't know what the threshold for deviation could be, but simply because there is deviation from the census, then you could just as easily say that any election separate from the census data year itself uh, would be unconstitutional. So uh, I really want us just to, uh, you know, uh, watch, uh, watch our language there uh, when it comes to whether or not we're saying right now that moving forward would be unconstitutional. And I would like to have a little bit more information from the city attorney pertaining to that option and whether uh, exercising an option that is granted by state statute. So I'd like to know how long the statute's been around. I'd like to know if it's ever been challenged in its own right. And, uh, and if this has ever occurred, right? What were the considerations from municipalities elsewhere when they uh, were ever confronted with this? Because I don't know if this is the first time. I know that this is a black swan incident in the, in the fact that we have had, uh, that, uh, that so many municipalities across the state are experiencing the same thing all at once. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there haven't been municipalities uh, individually in the past that have experienced this. And I'd like to know uh, where they stood on it and what their conversations were. And as much as legal challenges are concerned, bear in mind that, yes, there could be legal challenges if we were to proceed forward now. But there could also be legal challenges. I'd like to know this as well, legal challenges if we were to delay a year. So we could be in a situation where we're between a rock and a hard place regardless. So I just wanted to make those points. I, I do think it's smart, and, and I would absolutely agree with my colleagues that um, seeing as how the General Assembly is talking about this now, we wait. Uh, we wait, we see if they weigh in, and it would be very helpful if they did. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that, Mr. Newton. So Mr. Baker has a lot of stuff to do, but can I say this? You know, there's the Constitution and the statute. But there's also the part of this community. And when you look at the map and see where Districts 2 and Districts 3 and District um, 4, 
have grown so much. I think a little bit about the equity, our equity lenses. We don't have the information by race and ethnicity, but somehow in my thinking is that we do need to draw districts that represent our community, not just for the constitutional part of it, but the considerations that the Constitution gives for it. And I by no means play lawyer and, and, and deeply regret it, but I, I just really feel like we owe our community the ability to have adequate representation in a way that addresses how we've grown in the last 10 years. I, I just want worry about that, that we are, miss, we are not getting um, the kind of representation that the community is in all of the areas that we'd like to. And I, I think that's an important consideration. But I have one more speaker, Mr. Driggs. Uh, yes. First, I wanted to comment that uh, rarely in my career in council have I heard such a chorus of dissent from what I said at the beginning of the conversation. So uh, I bow to the majority on that. Uh, uh, I'm fine with the idea that we should wait. Um, I just wanted to mention, I think questioning the interpretation that we got from the city attorney um, sends a bad message. So if we need to have that discussion, maybe we should. But in my mind, from conversations with other people, the consensus about what the city attorney told us is widespread. Uh, and I did myself test the hypothesis that if we were able to have an election in 2019, based on what must have been unequal districts then, then, you know, isn't it possible that we could have one this year, uh, given that we don't actually have the results of the census? And the chorus of replies I got from, from different people who have different reasons to have an opinion about this, qualified opinions, was no, the situation is very different and the, the uh, likelihood that we would face a challenge that might well overturn the results of the election is very high. So I would encourage us all to get behind the city attorney on this one and, and follow that advice uh, and, and be guided by uh, the facts that have been presented to us. In, in terms of <laughs> and we love the cat. I know. That's my <laughs> political advisor. I'm not sure if it's good to have him in the room with me. But, uh, I want to know, does, but, is the cat a D or an R? <laughs> uh, actually, I'm specified, but you can tell that the cat has no discipline. And I've gotten so used to it that I'm not even distracted when he walks in front of my face. Um, must, be, must be an R, then. It's, it's, it's basically a pathetic attempt to win the sympathy of my colleagues on council. Um, so anyway, really, let's, let's just... Uh, well, let's work within the framework, uh, the very thoughtful framework that we've received from the city attorney. And Mr. Newton, if, if you want to have discussions about legalities, uh, uh, you know, you may do so. But I, I don't think that people should take away from this meeting a feeling of uncertainty about the interpretation of the law that's been handed to us today. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, again, the intent of this presentation was to get the questions out, to get the facts as we know them. No actions required, we'll just keep um, going forward. Now we get to go to the second area that the city attorney has been working with, the um, council budget and governance effectiveness. You, I think we're gonna be the most effective council in the entire world if we keep at this, Mr. Driggs. So we are looking at now the uh, mayor and council ethics policy proposed revisions that came out of budget and effective governance. So are you going to start, Mr. Driggs, or is Mr. I, Baker going to I just going wanted to, to offer a brief comment, Mayor. Uh, for one, the members of the budget and effectiveness committee are myself as chair, uh, Mayor Pro Tem as vice chair, and council members Ajmera, Graham, and Johnson. Uh, we had a three to two vote on the... Uh, the uh, proposal that you're about to hear from the city attorney, uh, I, I think uh, I've heard that two, the two people who dissented then uh, were basically not in agreement because uh, the uh, draft was presented to us on very short notice before the meeting. So Ms. Johnson and Ms. Ajmira, I hope I'm right in suggesting that you are now in agreement and that therefore this proposal can be taken as being unanimously recommended by the committee. Uh, and. Without objection from those two, I would I would hand over to the city attorney to talk us through. That's correct, Mr. Baker. And Madam Mayor, uh, members of council, uh, as part of our uh, opportunities and efforts uh, to divide the work, uh, I'm going to turn uh, the, this uh, 
discussion uh, and going through the PowerPoint uh, to Deputy City Attorney Lena James. I'll turn it over to her now. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. It is my honor and privilege to be here with you this evening. Um, I think most of you have seen a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. I'll try to go through it fairly quickly. You should also have received and had an opportunity to review a what we attorneys call a red line copy of the policy that, that includes the proposed additions and revisions that came out of the Budget and uh, Effectiveness Committee that were approved and a clean copy of that same policy, which may help with ease of reviewing some of those sections. So just wanted to touch base on that. Um, if we can go to the first slide, the background and ethics policy, and I will just preface some of the information that is in the presentation by saying a lot of what we put in here was put in at the request um, of, or questions that came up over the course of the last six months from the Budget and Effectiveness Committee and various council members. So over the course of that time when we had questions about the history of the policy, how long it's been around, what the law is that requires council to adopt such a policy and so on, I wanted to share that. I think it's fairly self-explanatory. I will note that the statute that requires council to adopt it was not enacted until 2009. And so you'll see on that timeline that in 2010, the Charlotte City Council adopted the Code, Code, of, Code of Ethics policy that it has now in place. And a very similar version of that policy is what applies for the city's boards, committees, and commissions. So um, as you can see in summary, I mean, the, the, the city has had a code of ethics of sorts for at least 40 years, dates back to, to 1978. The critical changes that were made the last time the policy was revised in 2015 are that a gift policy was added, the disclosure requirements were added, which um, are, are reflected in the annual statement of economic interest that you complete every, I believe, February. Um, there was included as well a, a process and a section for how com complaints are received, how they're reviewed, and, and sanctions associated with any violations. And then again, in October of 2015, council adopted it for boards and commissions. So council adopted it for itself in February of that year and subsequently in October for the, um, for the rest of the committees and boards. And, and just to summarize, and I believe it is in your policy itself, but the, but the gist and the guiding principles behind governing bodies, and this applies to county commissioners, to school boards, and to other governing agencies, the idea is that there are five guiding principles that apply. And those include obeying laws with respect to official duties, upholding the integrity and the independence of the position, avoiding impropriety in official duties, faithfully performing duties, and conducting affairs in an open and a public manner. So we can move to the next slide, slide three. Just wanted to give you a high-level overview of the current ethics policy. So the two sections that we are proposing revisions to based on the feedback that was received from the council as well as from certainly the Budget and Effectiveness Committee relate to Part A of the policy, which has to do with uh, the Code of Ethics, and then Part D of the policy, which has to do with complaints, review, and sanctions. The Current language in that section simply states that for potential conflicts a, that may be misunderstood, a council member should seek the city attorney's advice. And I'll talk a little more about what the proposed additional language is, but that's the, the status of what it is as of now. The new section that was added to the policy in 2015 included these, these sections with respect to complaints. And you'll recall that in September of last year, we made a limited revision to a portion of, of this section. This is where the term investigator was removed, and we subsequently added the independent outside counsel language. So the, um, the red line and the clean versions of the policy that you're looking at include those changes which, which council adopted in, in September of last year. So right now, the three-prong test is fairly um, limited in that it, it simply requires somebody who files a complaint to identify themselves, 
to state with specificity the facts that form the basis of their complaint and to cite what provision within the policy they're alleging a violation has been made under. The clerk then forwards it to the city attorney for initial review. And if the city attorney finds that the, the complaint fails to provide information, the complainant is, give, is, is told to do that and, and is given a chance to provide it. After that, if they still are unable to complete a, 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 or fill a complaint that meets those three prongs, then the city attorney closes that particular review. If the three prong test, again, identifying those three parts is met, then the only uh, avenue available to the attorney at that point is to simply refer it to the outside uh, counsel. We can move to slide four. This is the second section within that Part D. This has to do with the review by the independent outside counsel. The process there is that the outside counsel would review the complaint that is referred by the city and make that determination of whether or not it is frivolous or does not state a claim. And in the alternative, to review and find that the complaint is not in fact frivolous, that it does state a claim, and if so, what the process would be. So again, at, at right there at the bottom, the next two sections, you'll see if the complaint is, is deemed to, to not state a claim, even if the facts are true, the city attorney would then, um, I'm sorry, the city attorney would, would be informed who would then inform the mayor and the complainant of that conclusion which is that it doesn't meet those three prongs. If it's determined that it does, then the, then the city attorney would pass that on, investigate it with the, uh, with the outside counsel and make written findings. The outside counsel will then provide that to the city attorney who would share it with the mayor, the complainant and counsel. So again, that's the, that's the current language and that's the policy that we've been operating under. I just note that the third part of that section, Part D is sanctions. It simply states that um, to the extent a violation is found or there's some finding with respect to that, the, the resolution that is available to counsel is a resolution of censure, the sanction, I should say. Um, there is no language about the removal. Those are just examples of the kinds of things that counsel could do, which is removing uh, potentially somebody from a committee assignment or leadership role. Um, and I will note again here, there are no proposed changes to the sanction section of the policy. This is just a summary of what it currently states. Slide number five gives you just an overview of what the status of the um, Code of Ethics policy was before 2015. Share this because these were questions that came up during uh, a number of our committee discussions, which is, what was the history of it before 2015? What was the impetus for adding some of the language that is tied to Part D, um, trying to delineate and understand some of the differences with harassment type complaints, those kinds of things. And I will note that um, there is a harassment policy that applies, but again, it does not apply with respect to any complaints that are made by any members of the public against council members. It is simply with respect to city staff and council members. So that second bullet that references the 2010 harassment policy is with respect to that. Um, and I think the, the rest of that slide is fairly self-explanatory. So if there are questions, we can come back and, and address those. Ms. James, we can't see that slide. Can we go to slide five, please? And again, that's the, the preview of what previous policies were before the 2015 editions. Slide six is a comparison of the, um, some of the larger cities and what the policies are there. Um, there's a lot of information there, and, and I don't want to try to go through all of it, but as you can see, in some cities under their ethics policies, council is authorized to hold hearings. Um, in some cities, the city attorney has no role in, in reviewing or investigating any alleged complaints or violations that come in. In some cities, Winston-Salem, for example, has, a, has the option of either 
the city attorney or an outside ethics officer doing the review and the investigation with respect to complaints that come in. Um, and again, I won't get into the details, but to say there, there are various protocols or steps that different counsel can choose to proceed in with respect to how they do a hearing, with how they notice a meeting in which they want to do that hearing, and so on. But, but none of these are, are comparable to, to what we have here in Charlotte. So now I'll try to focus on and kind of uh, hone in on the discussions that were before the budget and effectiveness committee and based on which the proposal is before you today. This would be slide seven. There were two critical meetings. Um, I think we had a lot of discussions through the summer into the fall with this committee. On December the 15th, the committee accepted certain um, proposed revisions that are before you and that are reflected on that red line document. Again, they are to section part A, 3B of the policy and part D of the policy. Um, there was another meeting in January, on January the 6th, um, where some additional clarifications were made to what was unanimously approved by the committee on December the 15th. So I think those are all reflected in there. I'll just point out that um, with respect to the potential conflicts of interest section, again, the section 3B as we refer to it, the feedback that we received from the committee members and through the course of that discussion was to have some language that strengthened the obligation of the council member to seek the advice of the city attorney. Rather than a council member potentially having to discern whether what might be uh, an ethical conflict or what might be certainly legally permissible but could be questionable again in the context of either impropriety or some other area, to the extent that that burden fell on them, if we could, if, if the, I think that what the committee was suggesting that is if we could strengthen that obligation on the council member, then potentially the, the rest of the steps in terms of what are done would remain the same, same, but the council member would then have the obligation so as to alleviate any question to make that a, a, an obligation to affirmatively seek the advice of the attorney. And, and, and what it seeks to do there is then make sure that actions which may be misunderstood or in instances where a council member potentially has a business or a real property interest that's disclosed on a uh, statement of annual economic interest is the subject of some city business, then the duty to seek that advice uh, falls on the council member. And if you look at the first bullet on slide seven and the first bullet on slide eight, and I'm sorry, they're separated by meeting dates, but those all speak to the same obligation, which is just to seek that, that um, counsel, that legal counsel, I should say, and uh, that that obligation to do it doesn't fall on the contractor, the subcontractor, or any, Steve, uh, or any city staff member. With respect to the, uh, going back to slide seven, with respect to the second item that's there for the complaint review, this is, a, this is where you'll see a bulk of the changes that were made. Um, and what we have done, and I think the feedback we had received and, and those on the committee will remember, there was a lot of discussion around the prima facie allegation standard. And prima facie is Latin for essentially, you know, something on its face. On its face, does the complaint appear to allege a violation that if the facts were true, may have some validity to it? And what we were trying to do here, based on feedback again, was to add some sort of a standard of review so that there's some threshold based on which the attorney has the ability to take a look at those complaints rather than simply say somebody has put down their name has put in a few specific facts and has cited a provision in the policy and I automatically now have to send it out to, to outside legal counsel. So the prima facie allegation speaks to that. It also adds some other obligations with respect to, to the attorney forwarding the complaint to the, to the subject council member, which was previously not in the policy. Um, also expands the and, and provides a specific window of time in which you could solicit some feedback from the complaint in the event the complaint is incomplete. Um, and I think those last two bullets speak to how the, the 
if, if the prima facie allegation is made, what the process would be to then refer the complaint outside. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to go to the last slide there, slide number eight, the second bullet number two there again speaks to the kinds of situations that might potentially fall within what the, the what the city attorney would review. And again, that's where, and again, this, there was a lot of discussion in committee about, you know, what, what kinds of allegations, how, how, how low is that bar and how high can it go? And certainly, I don't think any council members uh, and certainly you know, committee members would want a city attorney reviewing or looking into anything that might be otherwise a criminal activity or something that some other agency or office is responsible for investigating or reviewing. So this was trying to put some guardrails and parameters about the types of events and the types of complaints that might require review and might meet that threshold. So it speaks to, again, the, the language that was added in 3B about connections that might include potential conflicts, any potential misappropriation of city resources, any potential criminal or fraudulent activity, harassment as that term is typically defined under law, and if any of the, um, if any of the allegations are tied to violations of law, such as criminal or fraudulent activity, then certainly the appropriate um, investigative agency the city attorney would refer to that party. Um, and you'll note that the previous section two has been deleted in its entirety. So it's now been replaced with some additional options and some discretion uh, once that complaint is reviewed, received and once that three-prong test is made. So I'll take a pause there and see if there are questions uh, or if folks want to go through the uh, policy itself. Um, Thank you, Mayor. Council members, you know, this is an item that's decided for the on your agenda, and there will be an opportunity for you to vote and explain your position on the vote. Um, it is now 610. We have source of income discrimination update and then the public forum, proclamations, and then the public forum. So what I would like to ask that you address questions that you need to have answered prior to the deliberation and debate on the item number 13. So, Excuse me, Madam Mayor. I'm I, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. I think you cut out for a second on my, my hand was raised for a question in this section. Did you say we were not doing I, questions here? I have not started at calling on council members yet, Ms. Watlington. I was oh, okay, just, I'm sorry. You cut out for a second, so I didn't know if you were saying we were holding for a later time. I didn't understand what you just said at the end. I'm good. I'm good. You're gonna. We're we're doing questions on this section right now, right? Yes, but I, what I wanted to say is that um, if you have a position that you are going to take, we can do that on the agenda when we vote on the item. So what I was asking is that if the council members would focus on the questions that you need to have answered to inform your decision making. So with that, I have council member, I recognize council member Watlington. Gotcha. Two quick things. I will first, council member Drews, I just want to know, it has in fact been six months since I said this. That was my fear from before. <laughs> no, but I thank you for uh, the work you guys have done on this. Um, I just have two quick things on slot four. If you could go back there. Down here at the bottom where it says um, sanctions, uh, any other sanction under the council's power, but then it says removal from committee assignments, leadership roles. Given that that is the mayor's power, is the intent here that the council will, just for the purposes of sanctions, assume those powers, or should that say the mayor or council's power? Or I just want to understand what the intent is here. Because it says council's power, but what's listed here is actually not the council's power, it's the mayor's power. You follow what I'm saying? Part D, section three, under sanctions, the second bullet. I believe I do, Councilmember Watlington. Um, the, so nothing has changed in that section, in the sanctions section of your policy right now. The language simply says the city council may sanction an official who is the subject of the investigation. Potential sanctions include the adoption of a resolution of censure and any other lawful sanction within the council's power. So simply by way of example, just as an illustrative matter, 
I was trying to describe what those could be, but that's not currently actually specifically written into the policy. Okay, so then what I, I want to make sure I understand what I take away from this then is that this here that you, like you said, it was just for illustration, the that's result of a sanction actually could not be removal from a committee assignment or a leadership role because that's not a power that the council has. That would have to come from the mayor. I believe so. Okay, if we could get some clarity on that ahead of the vote, I'd appreciate it. Um, and then the second part where it's got, and it might have been the slide before, um, it just mentioned that um, complaints, information will be given to the complainant and also the mayor. In the event that the mayor is uh, whom the complaint is lodged against, can we add language for the mayor pro tem to assume those duties in that case? That seems appropriate. You wouldn't want the person that's being investigated investigating. Right, exactly right. That's it. Thank you. And I think Councilwoman, uh, I believe, uh, Watlington, I believe we have some language along those lines in section do, 2D, in the proposed 2D. Ms. Watlington, did you hear that? I did, thank you. All right, Mr. Winston. Yes, I just wanted to um, uh, just on, on what Ms. Watlington was uh, questioning. Um, it, civically, uh, the council, the manager, um, and the mayor are three separate um, positions and offices. And and including included in that are powers that we have uh, to check and balance each other. Um, so while there are a lot of uh, responsibilities of the mayor and privileges of the mayor, for instance, putting something on the agenda or setting the agenda, uh, the city council does have, through the voting process, the ability uh, to change um, uh, the mayor's decisions. Um, likewise, the mayor has ways that she can change um, council decisions, at least delay them or, or, or push for other things. So I would I would imagine that removal from committees, assignments, or, or leadership roles are something that could be actionable um, should the city council uh, 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 be able to uh, organize itself um, to, to vote and, and check and balance the mayor. All right. Any other comments or questions? Any other questions for the staff before we move to the next item on our agenda. I don't have any other questions. So thanks everyone. Thank you for the hard work of the committee um, doing this and the clarifications. It is item number 13 on the agenda tonight. So the last item that we have um, prior to our proclamations are the source of income discrimination, which I believe we had a two hour discussion um, a week or two ago and um, that the, we asked the committee to go back and take a look at this. And I'm going to ask Mr. Graham, who will be joined at the podium, or Ms. Weidman just walked into the room, but I'm going to ask Mr. Graham, chair of the committee, great com neighborhood committee, to um, introduce the work that has been done since our last meeting. Thank you, Madam Mayor uh, and members of council. Uh, the great neighborhood committee met uh, last week. Uh, we uh, reviewed the source of income discrimination um, recommendations from staff. Uh, we made one minor amendment to it. Uh, I'll have Ms. Wyman speak to it. Uh, and we also, uh, so we approved it and sent it back to the council for consideration, along with a uh, item that uh, asks for the city council to uh, vote on whether or not we would like to go into closed session with our attorney to talk about legal matters as relates to it. Um, uh, so Ms. Wyman, I, I teed it up for you if you can kind of just walk through where we were um, and uh, the outcomes of the meeting. Ms. Mr. Graham, before Ms. Wyden begins, may I ask, the, um, my understanding would be that if this is something that the council um, would agree to accomplish, that we could direct Ms. Wyman, the city manager, and Ms. Wyman to take this action to, um, as discussed by the committee, um, and does not require a vote on an agenda item. So it's something that's an action that the city manager can direct to do if the council agrees tonight. Is that um, your understanding as well? Uh, I think so, but I'll let you and the city manager outline the process for approval. Okay. Um, but certainly um, we voted out of committee uh, to send to the council for their consideration. Okay. Along All with right. another 
um, item that we voted on as well. That was a part of the motion. Okay. So there are two parts of the motion. Mr. Jones, you want to proceed with? I will turn it over to Ms. Weidman. Okay. Good afternoon, um, Mayor, Council, and, and Manager Jones. Just very briefly, um, as has been stated, we went back to the committee. We had another discussion at our February 17th committee meeting, I believe it is. And so the two things that I'll point to after hearing um, hearing from you all um, at the, at the um, previous council meeting, what you will see represented here is a shortened time frame. Um, so we're proposing to end this work um, in December of 2021, rather December 2022. And what we've also built in along the way is periodic reports about how we're doing back to the Great Neighborhoods Committee. And if at any point we feel like we're moving faster, um, we will certainly bring this back to you prior to the t December 2021 day. Deadline, um, and so that's that. The, that's the the major emphasis. And Wendy, if you'll go to the next slide for me, please. So the recommendations are still the same. I won't um, read those to you again. And then if you'll go to the next slide for me, please, Wendy. And so at the February 17th committee meeting, staff accept, accepted. Um, staff recommended. Um, made this recommendation and the committee accepted staff's recommendation as amended and just a, just a, a wording about the as amended. Um, we talked about the shortened time frame um, and we also just want some clarity is do we proceed with convening the group? And there was some reluctance, I'll say, on staff's part to do that if, the, if there needs to be a discussion um, that the full council go into a closed session um, to confer with the city attorney about legal implications regarding source of income. So we just want to get some clarity from you tonight um, about how you all would like for us to proceed. And that ends my presentation. Mr. Graham. Well, thank you, thank you, Ms. Whiteman and, and um, Adam Mayor. Uh, and I think those are two separate recommendations in terms of staff recommendations uh, as amended. Uh, I think the committee uh, is ready to move forward with that, uh, with the uh, proper um, process and procedures by the manager or the mayor. I'll really not really vote on it, or the manager has the authority and has the power to, to get it done. Uh, and also, again, um, that. Um, uh, there was a, uh, a majority of opinion that we would like to have a close session to confer with the city attorney about legal implications regarding source of income. I don't feel that prohibit, prohibits us from moving forward with the first recommendation uh, at all. All right. Ms. Jones, do you have any comments before we open it up for the council discussion? No, no Mayor, we're ready for the council discussion. All right. Mr. Winston? Yes, I, um, so I, I wanted to talk about uh, recommendation number two um, and why I made it. Um, the, the concern uh, here is if, if we do something uh, that eliminates a source of income discrimination from our local uh, fair housing ordinance, um, is that this could put us in a legal pr predicament, i.e. open us up uh, uh, to um, lawsuits uh, uh, if, if our ordinance creates um, conditions uh, that businesses, business owners, i.e. landlords, uh, uh, feel that does them damage. Um, and, and so if we do make those changes, being that it is a legal uh, 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 situation and we would have to have a legal strategy, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, for the business of Charlotte that we confer with our legal team as a group uh, to talk about said strategy. So that is uh, the, the rationale. Um, and the only way for us to do that as an entire council, for us to all be on the same page about what that legal strategy uh, could, should, or shouldn't be, uh, is if we go into closed session um, with, our, with our attorneys. Uh, so that was the rationale um, from, from that recommendation. Happy to um, have any kind of input um, um, from uh, management or staff or our, our legal team um, if, if there is anything else um, to add to that. Thanks. All right, um, any comment from the city attorney or the city manager? Hearing none, Mr. Driggs is up next. Uh, thank you. I think given the, uh, the various interests at stake here and, the, and the, the various equities at stake here, that the recommendation we have to proceed with this process to consider it and to engage with all the parties makes a lot of sense. And uh, I think the closed session 
uh, would make more sense if necessary in the course of that process and not as a precondition for it. Um, I'm a little leery of closed sessions generally, and this one would presuppose uh, a state of conflict between us and landlords to qualify for, uh, to meet the requirements for a closed session. Otherwise, we can get advice from our attorney uh, anytime we want and should do so publicly. So I think it would make more sense if we could to just proceed with the recommendation that comes out of committee and take up the questions that we might discuss with the city attorney in the course of that conversation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Driggs. Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you, ma'am. I just, um, I, I have some questions. You all know how, that I'm an affordable housing advocate and I'm, I'm, I'm engaged with this. Uh, so I, I, I have some questions um, because I don't, I, I don't feel like the council is uh, maybe aware that the, the advocates have been working with the city on this issue since 2017, perhaps prior to um, any of us being on council, I'm not sure. But I just feel like another committee is, is, is not progress on this issue. There have been committees. This, since I've been um, on council, we had to be the COVID task force committee to make the recommendation to the Greater Neighborhoods Committee, which went to the Intergovernmental Relations Committee, which went back to the Greater Neighborhoods Committee, which is coming before us. I, I feel like this, the information has been provided. There's over 35 housing organizations that have presented information. So I, I, I'm concerned uh, or questioning what will the ad hoc committee do? The, um, and Livian has a committee. You know, they can be working on, if there's some gaps, if there's some specific questions that we need answered, then maybe we can get that. But the information has been provided. So uh, it's just concerning that this feels like kicking that proverbial can down the road. I would also ask if, if, if we've heard that a state legislature is not going to a allow us to create an ordinance what are we hoping to obtain in the eight months? What information do we do we think that we're going to get in the eight months that's going to change our ability to create a state ordinance? I've said it before, um, and I'll say it tonight. The, the way that we can take action and, and have progress is if the city creates a, a policy that if the there are developers that want city or public dollars, then they are the ones that we can create the policy that they are not allowed to uh, discriminate based on source of income or, or you know, re-entry as far as I, I, I believe. So I, I just don't know that what the difference will be in eight months from today with another committee. We've had an ad hoc committee on this, this issue. There were, there could have been committees, I don't know, prior to us being elected, but the information that we are seeking, I believe we already have. It's just about our political will to make a decision and put our votes where our mouths are, in, in my opinion. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, let me follow up because I want to make sure. The first recommendation is adopt a policy requiring mandatory acceptance of housing choice vouchers in all city supported housing. And that would be the first action by the council to do that. Um, the second one is encourage and monitor changes at the federal level. And then the third one has a very specific charge to an advisory group. So I just want to make sure that I, I agree with you that in housing, anything that we put our government money in, we have a lot of control over. And I thought that the first recommendation, and maybe I should ask this of Mr. Graham, if the first recommendation would be for the manager to come back with a policy doing and accomplishing this, which is, I think, one of the things that's really important to the core of it. So um, I don't know whether to ask Ms. Wyman or Mr. Graham that question, but I thought that's what the committee recommended. So yeah, I, I'm going to toss it to Ms. Wyman because I, I basically kind of asked the same question uh, to Ms. Wyman, so I uh, would love her to respond to, mm -hmm. to Mrs. Johnson publicly as well. 
Yes, so thank you for that. So that is indeed exactly what the first recommendation, and we're currently working on that. And so yes, it would be to bring you all back that type of policy. I would say the other thing is, is while there has been a group of advocates meeting working around this, what we have not done is we've not engaged, to my knowledge, right, um, we've not engaged, let me say from a city perspective, city housing staff has not sat at a table with both the advocate group and the, the private market owners who actually have the, the units that we need um, to be fully engaged in this process to hear from them. There is some missing information. CHA, you're right, Ms. Johnson, there is a lot of information, but there is some critical information specifically about the vouchers that we need to get our hands around as well. And so that would be the different work that has been done um, since the advocacy group has been working together. Ms. Johnson, is that okay with you? I mean, I, I, I heard well, you express that concern. And let me clarify, when we talk about city dollars, I don't, I don't want to limit it to just the tax credit dollars. I mean the, city, the public dollars, which should be used for public goods, such as the CIP and the TIG or any dollars that developers approach the city for, then we need to um, create a policy that those developers are, are not able to discriminate against our most vulnerable residents. So I would say public funding. Also, um, it, as far as those gaps or those questions that we, the city staff might have, Ms. Weidman, is, is that a matter of an, an email or a question or, or getting those questions answered and, and filling in those gaps rather than wait eight months, especially if in eight months there's, we're not going to have any more ability or authority to do any more at a state level than we can do. So that's the, what I was saying about another committee. I'm just, I'm, I'm prepared to take action and um, because there are people every day or every month that, that need these, these, these services or need for us to take action. I've said it, I, this will be my third time saying it, but there are landlords that are now discriminating against tenants who receive funding through MC Hope and through the city. Landlords are not uh, renewing leases. So we have to, be, as a city, really take actions to protect our most vulnerable residents. Um, but that's, that's my only, um, I, I'm, you know, we, we need to do something. I just, don't, I, I just don't know that another committee will be necessary when this is, has been an issue on the table since 2017. That's, that's four years. We, if there's a question we need to ask or communication or open it up, you know, these are the kind of issues or, or questions that might be answered in eight days rather than another eight months. So that's my only question Ms. and my concern. Ms. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Johnson, I can hear the concern and, and your question. So I, I understand we don't have the specifics of the policies in front of us, but we have a roadmap for those policies to come before us sooner than later. I would assume that one would not be something that would take eight months to come. Um, the committee that causes people to collaborate um, instead of feeling like there, something's being done to them instead of with them might take a little bit longer. So I completely understand your point. Okay, so um, I see Mr. Newton has a comment as well. And Mayor, thank you. Uh, so I would agree with Councilwoman uh, uh, Johnson here. Uh, I feel like we have a, an, an ethical and a moral imperative to, to do more to, to, uh, to attempt to get uh, source of income discrimination within uh, our, our ordinances. Uh, this is probably not going to come as a surprise to Councilmember Driggs, but uh, I'm frankly personally not convinced uh, that, uh, that, that we can't enforce uh, such an ordinance uh, it, it's not something, I, I, I get this idea of Dillon rule, but the, uh, the fact is, is that it's not something that, as I understand it, is specifically prohibited by state law. We pass ordinances, uh, amend our own ordinances, pass new ones all the time. But I don't know if uh, something even as, as large as the, the restructuring of our unified or, or, or of our development ordinance in the UDO, 
is, is something that's going to require uh, some sort of overview. I think it goes without saying that we have amended our discrimination ordinances in the past. And I think that Ms. Johnson made a very good point. It's not whether or not it could be enforced. It's whether or not uh, the, the legislature, uh, so the General Assembly, uh, will uh, overrule it, right? So it's completely enforceable, completely legally, uh, or completely legal when we do it here. It's just a matter of, of what they may do. And I will draw a stark distinction between uh, what you know a prior uh, non-discrimination uh, amendment uh, uh, wrought uh, in as much as the composition of the General Assembly is concerned. You know, back then, uh, this is a bicameral system, bicameral legislature that we have requires, you know, certainly the Senate, the House, but then also the governor's approval. And back then, uh, uh, that certainly wasn't going to be forthcoming. I don't know if that's the case today. Um, so I, I very much welcome uh, the, the opportunity to have more of a discussion about this in closed session. Uh, I, I welcome the opportunity to pick our city attorney's brain about this, to ask more uh, pertaining to to this enforcement issue, because uh, I, I really question, once again, I'm not convinced that us passing or including amending our current ordinances uh, so that source of income discrimination uh, is no longer allowed in our city, uh, I'm just not convinced that that, that can't be enforced. Uh, so, uh, so anyhow, uh, that's my take on it. I would agree with uh, Council Member Johnson. Uh, we've been having this conversation for quite some time. I figure we kind of know where we're at. Now the question is, how do we get to where we know everybody wants to be? And uh, uh, let's have this closed session conversation do that. I think that um, we've got the recommendation from the committee and we've heard some comments. I've got Mr. Phipps next. Mr. Phipps? Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor. I think, uh, I guess I was struck by something that the, 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 executive, well, the, the executive director or the chair of the uh, Community Relations Committee said uh, at our meeting, our last meeting, he talked about uh, building a, a, a stronger business case. And I think the same comments were echoed by our attorneys and I, and I asked the question last time that, you know, whether or not we had even broached this with our own delegation. Um, and I thought I heard someone say that it hadn't. So I would think that this period of time, which I'm glad is shortened, that uh, it would give us enough time to build a, 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 a better or stronger business case and it would inform uh, the direction that we would go in terms of how we would approach whether or not we change the ordinance or amend the ordinance or whatever. So, uh, um, you know, the business case is, do we think we have a strong business case right now? Because what I've heard from these individuals, I, I don't think that they're so sure. So that's all I, that's what I wanted to bring up. Thank you, Mr. Phipps. Ms. Watlington? My comments are going to be similar to uh, Council Member Phipps. Certainly, I've said before from the dais that I don't want us to be kicking the can down the road uh, either when it comes to source of income discrimination. I also, however, upon reading some of the information that was sent over uh, to us from the Housing Authority, it I do see the need to strengthen our business case. I just certainly don't think that um, action needs to be delayed at all. And I'm happy that we were able to see um, a shortening of the timeline. But my, I, my expectation here is that we proceed immediately with the staff recommendations on a parallel path with the closed session uh, without any delay. I, I also anticipate that these conversations then are happening um, in short order. And so whatever learnings that we can get, whatever data we can uh, develop or gather based on the, the new metrics we're able to go get. And I don't, I don't think it's a, we have to wait until December, but it does appear that anybody looking at this from the outside in uh, would need more solid information that would, dis that would show clear disparity and for the reason of source of income uh, discrimination. We know there are extra vouchers, but I don't see even the information from Olivia quite yet a connection to this is 
due, and we can prove that it's due to source of income uh, discrimination. And so that's the piece that I just want to make sure that what we do is going to be effective. Um, and I think ultimately, if the desire is to increase utilization of housing choice vouchers, that we know there are some things in the process that we can uh, that we can address. So I. I say that to say that I don't think it's an either or. It's a let's get to work now. I think we decide that tonight. Um, we get together to find out what our, what our other options are from a legal standpoint in the meantime, and then we, we adjust as necessary. All right, um, Ms. Watlington's question, I'm going to ask Ms. Weidman to confirm her her positions and, and statements. I think that that's what I heard you saying, but I want to make sure that that's on the record for Ms. Watlington. Sure. So what, what I'm understanding is that you all want us to go ahead, get to work with an advisory committee, uh, an advisory group convening them, that group, while you all travel a parallel path consulting with the legal counsel. Is that fair? Ms. Watlington, is that fair? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. All right, yeah. Mr. Bakari. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. So, Mr. Attorney, this question is for you. Is it permissible for us to go into a closed session to talk about what is essentially a policy strategy on our behalf and to discuss with you to avoid how we can have lawsuits and a legal strategy for us to pass an illegal ordinance. So typically, I can, we can go into closed session where I can provide you legal advice, but to have a general policy discussion in closed session uh, is not permitted by the statutes. Um, I just had a brief conversation with the manager, and, and we'll put our heads together about how to have that communication because it may just be something to where I give you a, a memo to make it easier, and then you can have your policy discussion, which is where you're you're going to want to go uh, anyway. Um, but uh, but but you're you're correct. Generally speaking, well, you cannot have a a, a general policy discussion uh, in closed session, but you can get legal advice from your counsel for which to base your policy discussion that would have to occur in open session, if that makes sense. Right. So but said more simply. We can have policy discussions and we can enact policies. And then if we have legal situations, we need to be in closed session with you uh, in order to understand a situation or defend or whatever that is, we can do that. But we cannot have a legal, a policy discussion under the guise of a legal discussion later on. Otherwise, you know, that isn't acceptable as a permissible closed session use. Is that, that right? That's, that's correct. You shouldn't blend the two. Uh, just by, you know, I'm going to have a, a little bit of conversation with the attorney and then the, the remaining 55 minutes is going to be on general policy. You shouldn't blend the two, absolutely. Right. So that, that, that's the entire problem I had with this the entire time. I'm certainly not opposed to colleagues exploring what those aspects are, but I think closed session is an improper use for that. This is a policy discussion right now, and quite frankly, it's illegal, right? So we can do one of two things. We can decide to break the law and, and pay those both legal and political consequences, or we can decide to do it the proper way, which is develop the business case, put the work in, and figure out how we can, we can convince other parties that, um, that we, we would require to be convinced in order to do this. And, and I'm, I believe the latter is what staff has proposed in, in part one. I think part two, your staff has already told us everything that they know, and perhaps you'll have more ideas, but a memo would be more acceptable there. Um, so uh, if we have to vote all of this in one uh, motion, I'm going to vote no. If it's possible to vote it in two, I would like to be on the record as voting and supporting number one. Um, but if that isn't possible, then, uh, then I'll just be a no overall. So I think Mr. Bakari's point is that you have to have something that the lawyer can assess as being um, worth the or, or meeting the statutory requirement for closed session and right now we don't have that and i think that what number one does is establish that with the recommendations out of this task force and that the hope is that the task force moves more quickly than not and makes a decision that the attorney can say the policy is consistent legally or inconsistent 
I, that's what I heard, but I know that many of you have had much more in-depth discussions around this. Mayor. And I was thinking that what I heard today um, was that if we had concurrence by the council, then we could go ahead and ask for one to be done under the recommendations that are there, but I'm not hearing concurrence by the full council. And I think that means we delay until there's actually an item on the agenda to vote on. Which, Mayor, can I? Um, wait, can, can I? Ask I, I have Ms. Isel first, Mr. Winston. Ms. I Isel, forgot to Mayor, add something that will add clarification to something that certainly. has been questioned a couple times. Yes. That's all. I'm fine with that. Go ahead, Mr. Yes, Winston. Yes, please. So there is, was a policy discussion, you're right. Um, it, it was absent from this discussion right here. The idea was that for step four, recommendation number four, uh, the one up to change the source of in income discrimination language or add source of income discrimination in our uh, local fair housing ordinance policy, I and, and committee suggested that needs to bump up to number one. And I believe that um, there's a possibility that we could uh, get the votes to bump that up to number one as opposed to number four, change the policy. We think, I think that steps two, one, two, and three, as it stands right now, actually work on changing the practice. But my intent, and I think from what I've heard from other council members, was to change the, that policy. And in, in order to change that, when you change that policy, that would trigger the potential legal situation, which, which I'm saying is we should prepare for strategically. If, if, if we do have the votes to make that change, that we should prepare strategically. And that's why we will go into closed session to confer with our lawyers to discuss that policy um, change. The, the, the legal I, I implication of that policy change. I understand what you're saying now. Yes, got it. All right, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you. First, um, can we get the slide on all of those steps? Because I'm, I'm kind of confused now as to what we could actually be voting on. Thank you. Well, we're not voting um, on anything. <laughs> well, I know, but what we would have been voting on. But I, I just want to say I'm, I'm very comfortable if we were voting on the things that our city attorney has made it clear that we could do, i.e., number one. And I, I agree with Ms. Johnson that any anything that we put public money into and we have the right to say that you have to accept vouchers or it has to be affordable, we should be doing. So I, I do support that. I'm not comfortable, though, going out on a limb and, and Ms. I'm not comfortable going out on a limb on items that some council members have interpreted that we can do when our city attorney has not has said that he's not comfortable. That that is why we have a city attorney. And whether you agree with that or not, I would um, go back to 2015 when we passed the non-discrimination ordinance, which there is not a doubt in my mind that we should be having an ordinance that allows us to tell people they can't discriminate against people because of sexual orientation. However, it was, we thought we had the right to do that. And I don't need to tell you what happened. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, even though we really thought that a lot of the world was on our side, we still were the ones that had everything to lose. We lost businesses, we lost sporting events, we lost everything. Even though people said, we agree with your values, you did the right thing. But there is a lot to lose, whether or not you agree with um, your own interpretation of the of the state law. And so my question, and I said this to Mr. Carter, and I have not heard back yet, but I, I want to know how they reached out to our delegation. I want to know what they've done to work with other housing authorities throughout the state to advocate and what have what's come of those meetings with the General Assembly. So, you know, when we go back to 2015, we could have diff done it differently. Maybe it would have had the same outcome. But even though you think it's the right thing to do and you know it's the right thing to do, the General Assembly has a lot of power and they have a lot more ways to hurt us than just what we think would be their ability to directly take away our right to do something. So I don't want to go down that path again. I want input from our delegation as to whether or not they think this is a smart move. I'll also remind everybody that they have their own legislative agenda. And I, I did have one of our representatives say, when you guys go and you do something and you don't talk to us about it, it puts our own state agenda at risk as well. So it's 
it's critically important that we work with them on these things, especially when our city attorney has has led us to believe that there could be some, some serious doubts as to whether or not we have the legal right to do this. So um, I'd like to get a lot more information on that and what the process is before we proceed in that direction. I, I want to um, add on what Mayor Pro Tem said. When this came up, I asked at the time, it wasn't in Living In, but it was the Charlotte Housing Authority, and I asked a lot of questions that would say, tell us where this is taking place, how it can be done, what's best for it. And, and the comments that I got back were very general and very broad, but we all know that from our experience, collaboration is a lot better than setting up a conflict situation and the same questions what is the housing what are the housing authorities the major just like we test ourselves when we're working on our non-discrimination ordinance we're working with metro mayors metro cities council members mayor pro tems across the state and we don't I don't I think sometimes people give us these issues and and assume that we've got the capacity to understand the passion that they have and so in some ways I'd like to um, say that there is a responsibility for a lot of our interest groups to help us be better and for us to actually give that feedback so that they can also understand what we have to go through and there are enough members on this council with the passion and the drive for this and we've we've got a lot of passion and drive going on on various initiatives i miss johnson sounds like i do about mobility and when and she when she is doing that what is our meeting with the in Livian board where is our meeting with habitat i listened to that wfae article this morning or yesterday morning about the number of people that we've put into homes that are having mortgage distress right now i think one of our top goals ought to be keeping those folks in those homes the homes that we help build finance and their mortgages are not being paid and so when we start thinking about this, we need to have some sense of what do we do, what do we do to make sure that the investments that we've made are successful, and what do the other organizations that have these same opportunities for investment, what are they doing to help themselves be successful? So, you know, I think it's one of those things that I would love to see Ms. Johnson start going to Enlivian board meetings. You know, that's how I learned about what uh, the Housing Authority did. I started to go and sit in and listen to the board members and bring up some of those issues that were important to our community as a whole. So when I look at this task force, well, one, I look at adopting the housing choice, which I agree with, and understand that we have the ability to do this in a way that can influence the 3,000 or 5,000 units that we're building. But I also say that we have the ability to help in Livian and other organizations be just as strong as we are. There are a lot of needs out here. So I, when I started out, I thought that we had some consensus on what to do with income source discrimination. And I don't hear that consensus right now, which means that we will end up having to put this on an agenda unless there is some direction from the council that says this is what we want to do. We have the staff recommendations. We can take them one by one and make a decision. But I think that the question is, is a total group, where do we feel that these, acts, these recommendations lead us? And I would like to um, recognize Council Member Johnson, who, um, I don't know, has anybody has, that has not spoken wish to spoke before Madam we Mayor, circle could I, back around? Can I just finish? With, yes. With my last comment, I just mm -hmm. want to read something that, that Ryan sent me from the School of Government. And it says at the end of the day, and, it, and it, it did say that it's a little bit ambiguous as to whether or not you could pass an ordinance like this. At the end of the day, it really comes down to the local government's tolerance for risk. Sometimes the blowback for stretching the bounds of local authority is severe. And then he says, see bathroom bill controversy. Like we need to be told that, but um, <laughs> other times it is non-existent. It's a tough. It's tough to predict if anyone will care enough to raise a fuss in a in the court in a court or in the general assembly about a particular local issue. And and all I'll say to that is Charlotte is different, and we've got. It's not that we shouldn't try to do things that we think are right, but we've got to do them with our delegation, and we've got to be very clear that this is what we want to do and talk to the
talk to the General Assembly about it, whether or not they agree with us. Okay, oh. Ms. Sage, I'm going to continue with the council members that have not spoken, and I'm going to recognize Ms. Ajmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As a former board member of, uh, in Libyan, formerly Charlotte Housing Authority, I'm very passionate about this issue because we all know that source of income discrimination happens. Uh, there is a data that shows 21% of the residents are not are being discriminated based on their source of income, whether that's Section 8 voucher, whether that's Social Security income, disability income, or veterans income. So this recommendation is a step in the right direction. Uh, I, I can't wait for us to move forward with this recommendation. It's not the perfect solution, but it is a step in the right direction, especially point number one, where we can we can ask folks who get rental subsidy from our city, from our housing dollars, that they accept uh, housing choice vouchers. So I think it's, it's a step in the right direction. And uh, uh, if, we, if we're going to keep delaying the decision, I, I just don't know where we will end up. Uh, there are a lot of folks that are looking for housing. They're not able to get housing because of this income source discrimination. And we got to take an action. And if it starts with number one, I'm okay with it and I'm ready to move forward. Thank you. All right. Ms. Johnson. Okay, Ms. Johnson. Yeah, thank you. I just want to just want to clarify uh, what the mayor pro tem said, and 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 I feel like we're sending mixed messages. I, I'm not in support of trying to create an illegal ordinance. I mean, we hear that you know if we create this ordinance, it's not enforceable. Uh, I don't I don't want to do that. So that's my question. What is the the purpose of this ad hoc committee to come back in eight months to to tell us? What I mean to, that that we can't create an ordinance because it will be Ill illegal. That's all I'm saying. If we know that we cannot create this ordinance, the way to address it is to adopt a policy um, with our with our public dollars and not just for rental subsidy for our public dollars. Now you can always create a, a council, a collaborative committee, because continuous improvement is always a, a great thing. But but if we, there's no point in a committee if it's if if the ordinance won't be enforceable anyway. That's all I'm asking. So are we saying that this would be dead on arrival, or we, the state won't work with us, or we don't have the ability to pass that ordinance, or are we saying that after eight months, it's possible that a solution will come back, and at that point we would have the jurisdiction or uh, the ability to create an ordinance. I want to pull okay. up. So I guess my box. Yeah, can we create an ordinance that uh, that the state would support? And if the answer is no, that, that we can't uh, create it on February 22nd, or we can't create it on what would that be October, or or eight months from now, you know, October um, 22nd. So that's my question. Bottom line is, can we create an ordinance that will be enforceable? If the answer is no, then the ad hoc committee is un un unnecessary for, th for this purpose. Now, if it's for the purposes of collaboration and working together and, in and improving the communication between the private sector and Libyan, well, that's great. But if, if we're simply not able to create a um, a an ordinance, then I say we we, we accept that, and we just create what we can, and that's a policy I, that, I, that requires developers seeking our funding not to discriminate against our most vulnerable residents. Thank you, Ms. Motion Johnson. to adopt second I think, I, I, recommendation. Wait, wait, Mr. Winston, please. Okay. Second. I, we have a line of people. Ms. Johnson asked a question. I want to ask the staff. I saw these as four separate organizations, four, four separate opportunities for us to improve what we're doing. I don't think that they're mutual. They are not mutually exclusive. I mean, they are mutually exclusive. And that four, I'm not sure. So I don't know what the attorney has been saying to the committee, but 
number four is about a fair housing ordinance. And I think that what number three is about is increasing the opportunity that the fair housing ordinance wouldn't have as many cases brought before it if that were in, if the number three was in place. So it's not a question that they have to go together. They're, my understanding is these are exclusive items each. Now, Ms. Weidman and Mr. Baker. And then we have Mr. Graham next, Mr. Winston. Ms. Weidman? So when we started this, our overall goal is to increase the acceptance of housing choice vouchers. And so after doing our research, we came back with these four recommendations, adopting a policy for all public funding. We've heard that. We're, gonna, we're working on that now. Uh, monitor changes at the federal level, create this ad hoc advisory committee so that we can bring in the private sector to hear from them about what it would take to increase the acceptance of housing choice vouchers, work within Livian to understand one of the main points is how many vouchers are going unused, how many vouchers, if they're being redeployed, what methods are or they are being used to have them redeployed. And if so doing all of these things to build a disparate impact case, that's the information we've had from the attorney. So we can show because we believe we will be challenged. We've done all of these things. They don't work. This is our business case. And then if we amend the ordinance, when we amend the ordinance, and if we get a legal challenge, we can show that we've built this business case or disparate impact case so that would give us stronger footing if you will if we are to get challenged on the ordinance mr baker please bail me out if i got that wrong no that that's correct and, I, and if i could just briefly expound upon the you've used the term disparate impact um that is a basis whereby you can prove race discrimination which you already have authority uh, to review in your fair housing ordinance. Um, so, so that's a lane that's available to us. It's in your charter. Uh, we don't have to worry about getting extra authority or, or having that authority uh, discussion argument, however you want to uh, uh, say that. Um, and, and our preference and our recommendation has been to stay in those lanes uh, that, that already exist. And, and if we can, uh, you know, particularly with number three, I've looked at that as our opportunity to review, um, you know, what vouchers are not getting used and, and why they're not getting used. Uh, and that puts us in the position to, to take a look to see if, if we can look at this and say, well, this policy of saying no to these vouchers uh, has a disparate impact um, over people of color, uh, for instance, just, just putting that out there. And if, if that's the case and we see that out there, uh, then we potentially already have a lane that we can go to without changing the policy at all. And again, without getting into that issue or that argument about uh, authority, uh, when we can stay in the, um, in the race discrimination lane that's already available to us. And that's, that's what I always assumed um, uh, number three was, because I, I don't, I've not been presented with the evidence to suggest that we've got disparate impact. I think I believe anecdotally that it's probably out there and that it may not be that difficult to, uh, uh, to, to get that information. But as I recall, um, uh, Mr. Ashford had put out uh, to, the, to the committee at least uh, that for two of the cases where the vouchers were, or were declined, uh, it was presented to those individuals that they may have a disparate impact race discrimination uh, complaint and they chose not to pursue that going forward. Um, I would again like to, to see, because we may have the evidence there, if we can mine it a little differently, um, that will allow us to address the issues that, that you all have raised and that are such a concern uh, to this community uh, in a way that's already uh, legally available uh, to us um, on the face of the ordinance that we have. All right, thank you, Mr. Baker, Ms. Weidman, Mr. Graham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Ms. Wyman really articulated what I wanted to say uh, in reference to outlining um, the, the staff recommendations and, and, and the intent, right, to, to build the case, um, uh, the legal case, Mr. Winston, for doing an ordinance if that is necessary. One of the things that we wanted, wanted to do was, you know, the carrot and the stick, right? So by putting the task force to work, 
giving those advocates who are listening to us right now an opportunity to be at the table. If you heard the discussion, Ms. Wyman indicated that the city now will be at the table along with uh, Olivia and the Property Owners uh, Association, which is uniquely different uh, than the discussions that we had before. Uh, and they are willing to see what we can do to provide incentives. I, I can't speak for the council right now, but certainly I will be very um, willing to support the advisory group in terms of those things that they believe we should be doing that will incentivize property owners to accept the vouchers, whether it's, it's the housing choice vouchers or uh, social security checks or whatever that they're not accepting, um, that we will do just that. And that's what the advisory group will kind of work to do. Uh, they also uh, will kind of begin to, again, Ms. Johnson, I think the communication really is important, right? Um, that we all know who's doing what and why. We, we all agree that discrimination in, in any form is, is not right. Uh, and certainly housing discrimination uh, is something that we got to deal with in this community. This last week definitely demonstrates that we got some housing issues um, that we cannot not avoid, that we have to confront face on. Uh, and I think that we're doing it, but we're doing it, what I believe, in a, in a responsible fashion. Um, that will allow the council uh, the type of um, leeway that it needs. Uh, and uh, the city attorney came to our meeting um, in November as well as in December and clearly outlined the pros and the cons in terms of doing what we should be doing. So uh, I, I would hope that we can get consensus around the recommendations so that we can move forward uh, eight months in the life of a city is a short period of time, um, right? Uh, Mrs. Wyman indicated that some of that can be brought back earlier if, if it happens that way, right? But we want to do it right. We want to make sure that we dot I's and cross T's. But I think there's an opportunity for us to be around the table to work some of these issues out. Uh, and if it doesn't, then, you know, um, then the council can do what it, what it needs to do. Um, but to not build the business case for doing this, uh, and notwithstanding that individuals in the community has been talking about this maybe since 2017, the council really had not got engaged in terms of a policy discussion about this really until last July, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I just hope that, you know, we can kind of, uh, as the mayor indicated, get some consensus because Number one is a big deal, um, the DOP uh, requiring mandatory acceptance. Uh, Council Member Johnson, I think you're absolutely right that the committee could examine all other uh, public funding um, that we do. Um, I think that type of recommendation I would love to, to get back from the committee uh, with the assistance of staff. Um, so I think the committee uh, can do some good work um, if we allow them the opportunity to do so and we move forward with the recommendations consensusly tonight. All right. um, Mr. Graham. I um, have Mr. Newton next. We are, uh, I, I do not hear a sense of, of um, concurrence on this. So we're gonna hear from Mr. Newton. We'll put it on the next business agenda. That's but actually I on for a vote. So Mr. Newton, and then we'll go to um, our proclamations and then to our public forum. We have 15 speakers tonight, so that'll be two minutes for each public forum speaker. Um, Mr. Newton? Yes, ma'am, Madam Mayor. I lowered my hand. Uh, I'm ready to move. I, I was under the impression that there was a motion made by uh, Council Member Winston, seconded possibly by Council Member Johnson. And so I was ready to move forward to question, but I, I, I lowered my hand, Madam Mayor. All right, so um, that's our last item on the action review tonight. I did make a motion to ad adopt staff recommendation number one. And Madam Mayor, my hand is up. All right, Ms. Um, Mr. N Can I go back, Mr. Winston? Please state your motion again. I make a motion to adopt staff recommendation number one. Second. Who said second, Mr. Bakari? Bakari. All right, Ms. Watlington. 
Uh, well, that was kind of where I was going. It sounded like we did actually have consensus on some of these recommendations. Um, it, I mean, I would really like to amend the motion to accept at least one through three, but um, am I to understand that three is the place where we don't have consensus? I'm sorry, I could not understand you, Ms. Watlington. I was just trying, in so much as, what I don't want to have happen is that we go another week or two well, and can't call the ad hoc group together. I don't know that I heard that nobody wants the ad hoc group. I think, and so my question for the group was, if we amended Mr. Winston's motion to include one through three, not just number one here, uh, would we still have consensus? Because if so, I'm inclined to do that. Because that to me is the, is the, the piece that's going to get us the data that we say that we need. Um, so I want to say, um, Mr. Mo the motion by Mr. Winston says adopt a policy requiring mandatory. That's going to have to come back to you on the agenda. So the manager, um, if we have agreement around that, we can bring that back at the next business meeting. If it, the same with the creating of the council of an ad hoc committee, the manager could implement that if we have the, I would say that we take the motion separately because I think that they require two separate types of actions. One would be coming back with a policy for the council to consider on, it, on the vouchers because it doesn't have the details in it. And then the second one would be to create the council, which the manager could probably work with Ms. Weidman to get done. Is, I'm just trying to figure out, but I have right now a motion for um, number one, which is to have the manager um, prepare policy with this intent. No, I'm assuming no. that's Mr. Winston because we don't have the policy now. Yes, ma'am. That was my understanding that it would okay. have to direct the manager to, 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 to so get So why don't to we work take that, Ms. Watlington, and then see if you can say if you want to do three and just have a separate motion on it. Okay, I'll Would wait. that work out okay? Just to be clear? So, Mayor, yeah, Mr. Jones. So, so I, and I'm going to really rely on my good friend, Patrick Baker. Um, I'm not sure that, I think this is where you're going. I'm not sure any of these are uh, an agenda item tonight. They are not. But if what's happening is somebody's directing me to begin a process to begin to implement these staff recommendations, I think that's, that's okay. That was the idea that, okay. you would, that you would get concurrence by the council to do item number one, and I think Ms. Watlin is suggesting item number three. So we have a motion for item number one for the manager to begin to develop a policy to come back, but the council will still have to review that policy. I was actually going with bring back the discussion, but I think that Mr. Winston, all right, Mr. Baker, what are we doing? I, I'm sorry, and, and, and I want to make sure that, that uh, the manager and I are on the same page. If we're getting from, from council a, a concurrence uh, or, or a consensus uh, is a better term, that that's what you want, I don't think you need to make a motion. We just need to confirm that's the consensus and the manager can then proceed uh, to act in accordance with the consensus to bring something back to you uh, for your adoption. You know, I really love my city manager and my city attorney, <laughs> but this is a virtual meeting. I know. And I can't see consensus. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, it's just really hard for me to see it. On the, I, I, I just, all right. So we can raise hands. But then that's not everybody being able to see whose hands are raised, unless we do it on the screen. Okay, so we're gonna to go to the screen with every council member on the screen, and I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand to have the manager develop a policy requiring acceptance of housing choice vouchers and rental substances in all city supported housing. So would you raise your hands for that? Ms. Watlington's hand, Mr. Winston's hand, Ms. Ajmere's hand, Ms. Isolt's hand, Mr. Eggleston, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Newton's two hands, and Mr. Graham. Whose hand do I not see? Mr. Driggs, Mr. Bakari, Mr. Phipps, and Mr. W Mr. Winston, is your hand up or down? It is up. Okay, so. Uh, my, my hand is up. I don't see your hand, Mr. Phipps. All right, we can't see your hand, so let's do this one more time. For adopting a policy. <laughs> I just have to get a record. I, 
Okay. So Raise your hand if you're for the manager developing a policy. Please put it up so that we can see it. All right. All right. So I have Ms. Watlington, Mr. Wait. I have a list here, and I'm just going to read it from the list. I'm getting like. Okay. I got my hand up. All right, Mr. Mr. Eggle, Mr. Eggleston, is your hand up, Mr. Eggleston? Yes, it is. Mr. Graham, is your hand up? Yes or no? Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Can I ask a question? Miss, uh, Mr. Newton. Mr. Newton, his hand is up. Ms. Watlington's hand is up. Mayor Pro Tem is up. Ms. Ajmira? Yes, her hand is up. Mr. Phipps? Mine is also Mr. Winston? Mr. Yes. Bakari? Hand down. Hand down. Mr. Driggs, hand down. So that is a majority. We'll have the manager develop the policy. Now let's go to item. Do I have, I'm going to go to item number three. Create a council appointed at ad hoc advisory committee group, not committee, to develop program enhancements, process improvements to the housing choice voucher program, including representatives. And you see the six that are listed here. All right, once again, if you would like the manager to work with the staff to get this done, please raise your hand. I see uh, Mr. Eggleston. Hand yes? Up. Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. yes. Ms. Johnson? I have a question. No, we, we don't have any more questions tonight. Well, just, we're going to put it back on the agenda if we don't have enough. Mr. Well, Newton? I, Where's Mr. Newton? I'm right yes. here. Ms. Yes. Watlington? Hands up, yes. Ms. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. 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 Mr. Winston? No. Don't need you. No. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. We have two actions out of this. We'll come back with those two actions, and um, I'm not quite sure what we'll do with the other two until we have a strategy from the staff and the, the city attorney and the city manager. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. We're now going to go into our formal business meeting for February the 22nd. Maybe we'll finish it by February the 23rd. <laughs> Um, we're going to have some, you know, no matter what we do, our, our, the people of this community um, do a lot of good work and deserve recognition. So tonight I'd like to recognize the following city of employee, city of Charlotte, the mayor's youth employment um, team, MIAP as we're called, and I'd like to recognize Don Hill, Andrew Klobelich, and I'm sure I'm not saying that correctly, Andrew, but just know that it's just because I grew up in South Carolina. Kim Jones, Tawana Thompson, Sterling Oliver, Omar Crenshaw, and Bethany Rodriguez. I'd like to also give special thanks to Bank of America, Atrium Health, Accenture, Siemens, CMS, and the other local businesses and employers who support the program and provide work experiences for our youth. And in that regard, I'd like to recognize a read a proclamation. Whereas the Mayor's Youth Employment Program provides all of Charlotte's youth with equitable career development opportunities, and the MIAC pro program assists youth with exploring the world of work and building social capital. capital. Whereas the program helps to enhance economic mobility for program participants, training and development for their workforce opportunities with jobs and career readiness training, work-based learning and employment opportunities. And whereas the City of Charlotte and local business community partners provide resources and work-based learning opportunities on behalf of our youth and provide high school age youth throughout Charlotte, particularly low and moderate income students, with diverse and inclusive work experiences to support their goals towards achieving upward mobility. Whereas February 2021 celebrates a huge milestone and is the 35th year of the program in the city of Charlotte. Now, therefore, I, Vi Alexander Lyles, Mayor of Charlotte, do hereby proclaim February 21st as Mayor's Youth Employment Program Month in Charlotte and encourage all citizens to honor the youth who have made a commitment to invest in the future success of our city. 
So thank you very much for all of the folks that work as mentors and employers and are willing to give a young person in this community the opportunity to see the value of work. The next um, recognition that I'd like to make is one that's very close to many of the people that are in our organization because this is a woman that worked for the city of Charlotte and gave, gave so much more um, than she ever imagined that she would. And so let me just start off with this um, Ramona Brandt Day proclamation. And this is being presented as um, a part of the work that's being done as reentry um, programs are taking place in this community. Whereas the number of women in prison has been increasing at twice the rate of growth as men since 1980, 80% 80 of women in jails are mothers and most of them primary caregivers for their children. Whereas Ramona Brandt was sentenced to life in prison on February 2nd, 1995 for a first time nonviolent drug conspiracy offense. And whereas on February 28, 2014, Charlotte City Manager Ron Carley announced that the city had banned the box for city job applications. And Ramona received clemency on December 15, 2015, and was pardoned by President Barack Obama on February 2, 2016, after serving 21 years in federal prison. Ramona Brandt was employed by the City of Charlotte from August 2016 until February 2018. During and after her incarceration, Ramona was an active member of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, an organization created by formerly incarcerated women with a vision to end the incarceration of women and girls. And whereas Ramona Brandt died unexpectedly on February 25, 2018, at the time of her death, she was in the process of organizing an internal education event for City of Charlotte employees to improve second chance job, op job opportunities with the City of Charlotte. Now therefore I, Vi Alexander, Mayor of Charlotte and a friend of Ramona's, do hereby proclaim February 25th, 21 as Ramona Brandt Day in Charlotte and commend its observance to all citizens. So I tell you, sometimes you just don't quite know what's going to be in front of you, but we continue to do Ramona's work, and thanks to Patrice Funderburg and many of the people that are taking this effort. And now I have one last um, commendation. Um, I think many of us know that it's a heavy heart that we talk and deliver the sad news in our community especially for the folks that grew up in what I used to call Druid Hills, Druid Circle. But over the weekend, Charlotte lost one of its most dedicated community leaders with the sudden passing of Darrell Reg Reginald Gaston. Darrell was well known to all of us on the council. He was exceedingly active in our business, the business of community building. He was president of the Druid Hills Neighborhood Association and a founding leader of North End Community Coalition. Also, he was part of a great team when he met Melissa and they married and they started acting as one. We want to offer support to his community, his family, and his loving wife. I want to say that we have a video clip that we'd like to show of Daryl Gaskin during one of his many appearances at, his pub at, at a public meeting. You know, last time Daryl called me, he said, um, I'm calling you because I want to know how you're doing. He didn't want to talk about what we weren't doing, what I needed to be doing, just how are you doing? And that's the kind of voice he always had. And I like to show this video as the way that Daryl lived his life. And Melissa, I hope you'll be proud. Please put on the video for us. My name is Daryl Reginald Gaston, and I am a resident of the Druid Hills community in the North End Court of Charlotte. And I like to say that North End is the best end. We have been the recipient of more than $100,000 in various grants. Uh, and through those efforts, they have allowed us to do some things that affect change 
in our course. And I think that through that work of being willing to share information, it gives you room to learn information. And I think that in life, it's important to always uh, be in a place where you can draw your circles a little larger, which is inclusive of everyone. And I like to say that everyone matters. We're all visible, vital, and valuable, and that we have to be intentional in our efforts of relationship building. So I would offer that Druid Hills really does have some things that we could share with other neighborhoods, and we're also open to some development and learning from others as well. And um, yeah, I mean that kind of wraps it up for the written questions. But do you have any any wise words you'd like to share? Well, I think when I think about wise words, I would have to say that change comes slow, but it comes, and that we can't always control the change that occurs in and around our communities, but that we can be actively engaged in that change and work with developers, work with uh, entrepreneurs, work with other business people who come to your particular corridor, whether you live north, south, east, and west. I think that we can be uh, a people who are interested in developing what I call healthy relationships, because the people, we're important in any community in which you reside, uh, any community where you live, work, and play. It's all about the neighborhood equity. And I would just offer, what is your neighborhood equity like? Thank you. Um, now I want to recognize Council Member Eggleston to read a proclamation for Elder Darrell Reg Reginald Gaston. Mr. Eggleston. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And if um, if you don't mind my taking an extra 60 seconds, um, and I, I feel even more compelled to read it because two of my favorite of Daryl's sayings were in that video. Um, but I was hoping to, to read something that, that I wrote down today and then, and then share the proclamation. Although apparently I got the order of his saying wrong um, based on what he just said. You are visible, you are valuable, and you are vital. This was one of many things Daryl Gaston would tell people to make sure they felt seen, appreciated, and important. No one ever walked into a room where Daryl Gaston was without receiving a warm greeting that made them immediately feel welcome and at home. Two days ago, far earlier than any of us could have possibly imagined, it was Daryl's time to be welcomed home. Daryl Gaston was a tireless advocate for this city and its residents as I've ever seen especially for his home community of the North End, which he would constantly remind folks was the best end. He and his wife, Melissa, advocated not just for the places, but for the people, and the work of Team Gaston will live on through Melissa's tireless efforts. The premature loss of our friend Daryl has left a hole in our community and a hole in our hearts that will never be filled. The city of Charlotte and each of us that ever had the pleasure of crossing paths with Daryl Gaston is better because of him, and he will be missed more than words can convey. To his entire family, and especially his queen, Melissa, know that he was and you are loved by so many in this community, and that you are visible, you are valuable, and you are vital. And Mayor Lyles um, issued this proclamation today. Whereas Daryl Reginald Gaston served the Charlotte community as a mentor, teacher, pastor, advocate, and servant leader, and whereas he was the president of the Druid Hills Neighborhood Association, founding leader of the North End Community Coalition and was instrumental in shaping projects, programs, and plans in the city of Charlotte, including the No Barriers Project, the North End Smart District, Stitch Together Charlotte, the Civic Leadership Academy, and Charlotte Future 2040 Comprehensive Plan. And whereas he championed public participation in driving residents to give input at every opportunity, including voting and census completion, and continued his work during COVID-19 to connect residents with opportunities through programs providing free Wi-Fi and digital devices to low-income residents. And whereas Daryl lived his values as a strong advocate for anti-displacement, jobs, education, and wealth building in the black community and served on the board of directors for both the Charlotte Area Fund and the Charlotte Mecklenburg Housing Partnership. Whereas he was passionate about the environment, which he demonstrated through his work with the Audubon Society 
bringing the Butterfly Highway through his lifelong home in Druid Hills. Whereas Daryl was a true collaborator working with multiple agencies, including the City of Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, Atrium Health, Dovemont Health, Habitat for Humanity, the Knight Foundation, Charlotte is Creative, and many others, he worked tirelessly to ensure the North End community and his residents were visible, vital, and valuable. And whereas the City of Charlotte and all of those who knew him were greatly impacted by his contributions and spirit, now, therefore, I, Val Alexander Lyles, Mayor of Charlotte, do hereby proclaim February 22nd, 2021, as a celebration of Daryl Reginald Gaston's life in Charlotte and commend its observance to all citizens by Alexander Lyles. Thank you very much. So these proclamations, um, Melissa Gaston will have this for you. Um, Ramona's niece, Ramona Brandt's niece, Dominique Brandt, and the National Council of Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, and Change Choices, the reentry transition home where Ramona lived upon her release, will all receive copies, as well as Don Hill, appropriately for our Mayor's Youth Employment Program. So thank you for this moment. Um, sometimes we have to pause to really think about what's truly important. Now, we have on our agenda our public forum, and we have 15 people signed up to speak. And of, because we will have 15 people signed up, each person will have two minutes to speak. And um, I'm going to recognize the list. I think my list starts, um, Stephanie, with Keisha Chirac. Sherat? Yes. Ms. Sherat, you're recognized to speak. You have two minutes. Okay, thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? We certainly can. Okay, I just want to say it's a pleasure and honor to speak with you guys tonight. I think it's no coincidence that I'm speaking on the night that you're talking about income discrimination because what I have to speak about that concerns my heart is similar. Um, I'm, a, I'm a resident of Charlotte and I live on the 36th Street in Noda area. Um, five minutes away, you have some of the best restaurants, some of the best breweries, some of the best artistic influences, half a million dollar townhomes, over a million dollar houses, and luxurious apartments that range from $1,800 a month to $2,500 a month. But what also is five minutes away is a community of the city's residents in makeshift tents on a day like today where they would be saturated with rain and cold and hunger, how is this possible that we can have million dollar homes, but five minutes away have a community of people living in tents? As I drive to work every day, I'm reminded of the homelessness problems that affect our city in the worst way. As I looked and Googled, I found that there was just as many, if not more, animal shelters in this city then there are homeless shelters. And this really bothers me. As a resident of this city, my heart goes out to all of the families that are displaced, who are in tents, who, unlike us, from the comfort of our home, can speak in heat with food, running water. They don't have this option. So it's my desire to come to you with not just problems, but solutions. Many cities have started doing tiny home communities for homeless. And I would just ask that you just, to put this in your heart to consider doing this. There have been many successful stories of this. Income di discrimination is very important, but I think we really need to realize that as we talk about making committees and doing certain things, that there are people out there in the cold right now who need our help. Every second that we wait, they're waiting out there, so. That's my concern. Next speaker is Andrew Archie. Mr. Uh, Mr. Archie, uh, he joined at the beginning and then he dropped off. He's, he's no longer with us. I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Archie, if you're watching, I'm sorry. It just took us a while to get here. <coughs> All right. Um, our next speaker is Gianna Pazulo. Pazulo. <laughs> That's right. Um, I'm Gianna Pazulo, and I'm here as an ambassador for the Borgen Project. We are a national organization that works to engage citizens locally in efforts to see stronger U.S. leadership to go toward improving living conditions. 
In the wealthiest nation on earth, millions of North Carolinians spend every day just trying to survive. Low wages, lack of investment in, in an infrastructure of opportunity, and an economy with rules rigged for the wealthy few have resulted in the lucky few amassing unimaginable wealth while children and families go hungry and struggle to get ahead. Poverty is a national problem, but, is, but it is a particularly acute crisis in North Carolina. Amid an economic recovery that has taken nearly a decade to bring poverty back to pre-recession levels, poverty in North Carolina is still worse than in 35 states. More than 1.4 million North Carolinians lived in poverty last year. Global poverty reduction boosts the global economy. Education plays a substantial role in this by closing the gap between the world's rich and poor. According to Brookings, studies show that the education gap between kids from poor and rich families has increased substantially, making it difficult for children from poor families to close the income gap between themselves and children from the rich families. It is, it is becoming more and more apparent that the education bridges these divides and helps accelerate economic growth. I'd like to ask the Charlotte City Council to send a letter to Senator Tom Tillis, Senator Richard Burr, and Representative Alma Adams, letting them know that the council views global development programs crucial for creating more consumers globally and new markets for Charlotte's businesses. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Celine Queen. Miss Queen? Yes, hello. Hello, thank you. You have two minutes. Um, so I'm coming on um, behalf of myself and my husband who recently had a house fire. And I've already talked to Ms. Tallon, who is the head of the, um, I guess the citations department. Um, I had a very bad situation with uh, one of the code enforcement inspectors. I've already talked to Councilman Griggs about this as well. But I'm coming to you guys because the letters that were issued to us, um, I did send a copy of one um, ahead of time. I don't know if it got sent out or not, but um, after having a house fire, getting a letter that says stuff like um, placing a lien on our property, um, issuing citations of 150, 250 and $500, getting a uniform citation for misdemeanor because of the uh, items that were in the fire that were still on our property um, less than 14 days after the fire when there was still an active insurance investigation going on is a very strongly worded letter and um, very offensive to me. Um, I actually thought it was a neighbor who had reported us, but apparently it's the fire department that calls the code enforcement inspector. And then when I called to get it taken care of, that gentleman was extremely rude to me. Um, we've also gotten up to six more letters. I don't know if you can see them all, but six more letters related to this house fire of things that we have to take care of on top of having to meet another housing inspector to look at the violations as well as our own insurance company. And then we had to hire a, um, a private contractor to come in, I'm sorry, a private, um, I can't think of the word now, uh, engineer to come in and to look at some of the areas that may, we may want to change because of some of the policies and procedures that are in place in the city of Charlotte. Um, I know the enforcement or the code enforcement office is already looking at their thank, policies for thank you, personal Ms. Queen. property. Ms. Queen. But I would encourage you guys to do that. as. Thank you. We're going to have um, a staff member contact you, Sean Heath. We'll follow up with you. Thank you very much for letting us know your concerns. Our next speaker is Vanessa Williams. Ms. Williams? Yes. Please go ahead, you have two minutes. Okay, my name is Vanessa Williams. Um, I just shortly been here in Charlotte, North Carolina for about a year and a half. Um, I work on the front line. I have been working in the medical field now for 35 plus years. And I've also been a foster mom. So I've also had a lot of kids that come through my home. Um, just about every Saturday or Sunday, I'm out feeding the homeless as well. And I have a major concern to move to a city that is called the Queen City and to see the homeless people that is in dying need of a place. And when I oversee so many abandoned buildings, looks like they've been abandoned for some time now. So my concern is to have all these abandoned buildings and have, um, people 32, 72 hours to move out and have nowhere to go is a major concern to me. 
Um, and to also um, to be able to um, the, the streets, the um, I mean, I, I, I work hard for everything that I have, including my car that I just recently paid off and recently hit a huge pothole in the street that I had to go and get my car um, service. So if the city pays for some damage like that, if they don't, I think that it should really consider in a major city that's called the Queen City to address these streets. I mean, I have never, other than New York City, seen streets as bad as, as Charlotte since I've been here. I've only been here a year. My other concern is, is I've only seen in the year that I've been here, and I kid you not, is probably five police officers. When I say patrolling, and I come from a small city too, from Los Angeles to California to New York, and have seen police officers patrol the area. And I think if the police officers are out here patrolling, not only because of a car accident or pulling someone over for a ticket, that they patrol the areas a lot Ms. better. Ms. Williams, your time is up. If you would send your remainder of your comments to the city clerk, we'll have staff follow up with you as a result of your um, your comments and requests for information. Thank you. Our next speaker is Craig Little. Mr. Little. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good evening. I'm a disabled United States Marine veteran who served from 84 to 97. I'm currently the local chapter president and the National Veteran Affairs Officer for the Marshall Port Marine Association. We would like to discuss the importance of recognizing the Marshall Port Marines and identify its ties to Charlotte, North Carolina. Many people know about the Army's Buffalo Soldiers or the Air Force's Tuskegee Airmen, but very few know about the history of the Marine Corps. They were the first African Americans to enlist in the Marine Corps after President Roosevelt issued the Executive Order 8802 in 1941. Their boot camp was not at Paris Island, South Carolina, or San Diego, California, like most Marines. They had to train in a segregated camp called Camp Marfa Point from 1942 to 1949. What importance does Charlotte, North Carolina have with the Marfa Point Marines? The city of Charlotte is identified in the history books as having ties to the Marfa Point Marines. There are two key individuals that have ties to Charlotte, North Carolina. One, Howard Perry, who was the first African-American recruit to set foot at Camp Marfa Point in 1942. And two, Lieutenant Frederick C. Branch, the first African-American commissioned officer in the United States Marine Corps, attended Johnson C. Smith. On November 23rd, 2011, then-President Barack Obama issued an order to grant all Marfa Point Marines this Congressional Gold Medal for their service and dedication during World War II. Are they famous Marfa Point Marines? Yes, they are. One in particular is the former mayor Mayor David Dinkins in New York City. In closing, although the United States Marine Corps was the toughest branch in the Marine Corps, it was also the last branch to end segregation. Thank you very much for um, your comments, Mr. Little. Uh, you, you are sending an, um, a really good point here, uh, especially about our history. Please continue to um, send your materials in so that we can read them and have, understand more of our opportunities around the Marines at Montfort Point, North Carolina. All right, um, our next speaker is Fulton Meacham. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine, Mr. Meacham. A young woman with children leaves work looking for a place to live, an apartment where she can call home. She looks online and finds an apartment advertising how wonderful it is. Good school district, close transportation, not too far from where she works. She has good credit, no criminal background history, and can afford rent because she has a rental subsidy. She arrives at the apartment community, and the property manager tells her, we don't accept housing choice jobs. Good evening, Mayor and the City Council. My name is Fulton Meach, and President and CEO of Bolivian. What I've just described to you is source of income discrimination, and we received over 1,300 signatures to stop it. You can replace this young woman I spoke about with a grandmother on Social Security, a veteran receiving VA benefits, your son uh, receiving financial aid. 
or a disabled daughter receiving disability benefits. Let's be clear, providing protections for source of income will not require housing providers to change their basic screening criteria or accept low rents. The Housing Choice Voucher Program is a true public-private partnership. And to the over 1,300 uh, housing providers on our program, I'd like to take this moment to say thank you for your partnership. I submit to you tonight that the so-called unintended consequences of a uh, housing market collapse because as a community, we decide to make sure that all citizens have the right to rent wherever they choose to live will not happen. But what will happen is we will continue to work together, we will adapt, and our community will be much the better for this newfound equity and opportunity in housing. All income counts. Please amend the ordinance to include source of income uh, protections. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Webb. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Webb. I'm the research director at the Center for Urban and Regional Studies at UNC. Uh, before I begin, I should say that the views ex I expressed today do not reflect my employer. Also, I have really bad allergies. Um, our center has evaluated in Libyan's participation in the federal Moving to Work demonstration for the past 10 years. Uh, Moving to Work is a federal demonstration program that allows a select number of high-performing public housing authorities the flexibility to respond to local housing needs through innovative programs and policies. Uh, in Libya, or excuse me, the Moving to Work demonstration has three broad goals that govern participation in the program, the most important of which, uh, to the discussion tonight, is to increase housing options for low-income families. Uh, among many of the policies that Enlivian has implemented through Moving to Work, uh, several aim to help Housing Choice Voucher families move to higher opportunity neighborhoods. Uh, one of these policies, known as Exception Payment Standards, uh, allows Enlivian to pay higher rents for Housing Choice Voucher families that move to higher opportunity neighborhoods. Uh, these rents are up to 50% higher than HUD standard rents. Uh, another Moving to Work activity uh, is incentives for landlords to rent to Housing Choice Voucher tenants, both to start renting to Housing Choice Voucher tenants and to continue renting to Housing, cho housing Choice Voucher tenants if they already do so. Uh, looking forward, in Libyan's Moving to Work participation uh, can allow it to continue to respond to local housing needs in innovative ways uh, should the City Council decide to implement a source of income discrimination ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is um, Anthony Lindsay. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, first, I'd like to say thanks for the work, the actions that you all have taken tonight on the source of income discrimination issue. Uh, my question is, is it impossible to draft a new city ordinance for source of income discrimination separate from the existing fair housing ordinance by instructing staff to bring forward a proposed ordinance in collaboration with stakeholders in the city attorney's office for council consideration in June of 2021, concurrent with your actions tonight of immediately adopting a policy requiring the acceptance of any legal rental subsidies for projects involving city supported housing, including TIGs or tax increment grants, tax increment financing, city improvement plans, and any use of city funds that involve the provision of housing and to immediately appoint an ad hoc advisory group to seek ways of removing barriers to the use of rental subsidies. What we're facing is above all a moral issue. At stake are not just the details of policy, but fundamental principles of social justice, the reputation and character of our community. Do we want to be seen as a place that allows social economic and racial discrimination to ferment out of fear to take decisive action against it. Thank you for your action tonight. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Our next speaker is Melody Heath. Good evening, member of the City Council. My name is Melody Heath. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Melody Heath. I speak before you tonight as in Libyan Residence Advisor Council President and on behalf of the 5,000 families that rely on a local housing 
Choice Voucher Program for Safe and Quality Housing. In 2019, cold calls were made to 57 housing providers along the Charlotte Lynx Blue Line. Housing providers were asked, do you accept housing choice vouchers? Of the 57 responses, 54 stated that the property did not accept um, housing choice vouchers. Of the three properties that did accept vouchers, all are mandated to accept vouchers. If we just try, if we just try to put ourselves in the shoes of these families who, who are searching for a desirable place to live in such a tight rental market, who confront persistent biases and closed doors, who are probably unstable housed during their search, and while in the middle of a global pandemic, their struggle should seem quite stark. Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, please do not, don't allow the outdated stereotypes of people on social welfare programs to dictate where certain people can live throughout the city. Please don't allow stigmas of what housing authority programs offer the community be a cause of negative outcomes associated with upward mobility and segregation by the race and income. When an Olivian research survey was conducted on landlord participation, HCV families were asked what they would like to what, what they like landlords to know about the program. Many interviewers offered the most th that most vouchers recipients do not fit the negative stereotypes that that they do that they are grateful for the voucher and they hope it Thank will. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miss Heath. Um, if you'll send your remarks to the city clerks, we'll make sure they're included in our record. Um, Ms. Brown, Ms. Brown, it's good to hear from you. Is Ms. Brown on? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Good to hear from you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council. My name is Lucy Brown, and I have served, I am serving as president of Olivia Stunridge Community Organization. I am a proud and active member of the board of directors of Olivia Resident Advisory Council, and I'm also proud to serve as Olivia Resident Board of Commissioner. Please vote yes to amend the city's, the city of Charlotte Fair Housing Ordinance to add source to income as a protective class. With this landmark legislation, housing providers will no longer be allowed to deny renters simply because they receive low-wage income, rental assistance, disability checks, SSI, veteran benefits, and other sources to help pay their rent. To me, source of income is discrimination is an important matter to both morals and economics. Passing this legislation will provide, will require courage from our city council and acknowledge to the fact that Charlotte is really a tough place to grow up poor. This issue about whether we are willing to be good, decent neighbors to those that you may not know much. Please vote tonight and add source of income as a protective class. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. All right, the next speaker is Sharika Miller McIntyre. <laughs> Ms. Miller McIntyre? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Okay, you have two minutes. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I am Sharkika Miller McIntyre, broker, owner, and property manager of Carrot Properties. I bring a threefold perspective to the discussion of support for source of income discrimination protection. My family's real estate portfolio has successfully partnered with Olivian, formerly CHA, for 18 years as a housing provider. Professionally, I have been able to educate and empower my owner clients for over 15 years to make informed decisions about subsidy housing. I am also a very strong advocate of our city's most vulnerable residents and believe that one of the foundational elements of upward mobility is access to safe and affordable housing. Though source of income is not a protected class under the Federal Fair Housing Act, our municipality has the opportunity to include such legal protections. I firmly believe that potential residents who receive any verifiable source of legal income from any governmental or nonprofit should be given an equal opportunity to apply for a home. The ultimate goal is that the opportunity afforded to these applicants will also result in the securing of expanding housing across our city, giving access to better educational opportunities and the introduction to new experiences for our most vulnerable youth. 
My support of the In Living program and other subsidies and its current efforts stem from my experience with all of the intentional actions within In Living to provide a new face to the program, revamp internal processes, and the concerted effort to give new perspective of voucher holders to the private landlord community. As an experienced housing provider, I can only attest to my overall experience with subsidy programs, but I earnestly state we have found that voucher recipients of any source pose no greater or less concern than a market-paying resident. We have found that allowing applicants the opportunity to apply for housing in which they qualify based on their voucher amount and overall application criteria equal to all other applicants has been a win-win situation for our owner clients, residents, and our office. Our own client. Thank you very much. I, we really appreciate that, um, your comments. So our next speaker is Nicholas Griffin. Mr. Griffin? Yes. yes, I'm here. Yes, if you would go ahead, you have two minutes. Sure. Housing choice, housing choice voucher families are disrespectful, freeloading families that tear up properties. They don't pay the rent and uh, get less from those that hold the voucher, pro that are holding the voucher. The families are not long-term, and they bring down the value of the house and the neighborhood. The HCV houses are uh, located in depressed neighborhoods, and the settle and the all st statements I have heard from landlords who are hesitant to participate in the HCV program. I'm a landlord that has participated within living HCV program, and I, like many others. Uh, had shared the same sentiment sentiment about renting to those with the voucher as others, and I was wrong. I have both those on the voucher program and those who are not, and I can unequivocally state that my tenants on the voucher program are more respectful of me and my property than those programs offered really make it easy to be a housing provider. provider. They're aware that the housing provider uh, and in living are in our partnerships uh, that if they tear up the property, they know that this could get damage their, prop, their uh, standing with the HCV program. The tenants pay their portion of the rent on time, and if they don't, they usually provide me with a, uh, a reason why it's going to be late and the subsidized portion from in living is automatically deposited and is never late. In living has also standardized its rent increase policy, which can go up to 10% uh, a year based on the market analysis. No one likes moving. HCV. Thank you very much, Mr. Durrell. We'll, if you'll send in your comments, we'll include to the city clerk, we'll include the remainder of them in the record. Um, our next speaker is Jody Hall Holt. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Charlotte City, Charlotte Council. My name is Jody Hall Hall, and I'm speaking to you today to share my experience of source of income discrimination as a client of an Olivian's HCB program. My last rental search process using the voucher was hurtful and stressful. I was just desperate in state to find housing that was made worse by landlords who repeatedly denied my voucher for no reason at all but just having a voucher. I was discriminated at least six times during my recent search, adding more stress and more unstable housing for myself. I felt that I must accept any housing option or else I was going to be on the streets and permanently ho uh, homeless. I believe some instance of income source discrimination was because of the color of my skin and because the landlord thinks that I would tear up their properties. Even after inquiring on my good rental, I feel like I didn't, they didn't want us in their neighborhoods. I want to view a nice unit that I could avoid with a voucher and when the property manager found out that I was an HBC client, she looked at me and rudely said, we do not accept Section 8 people here. After 20 years of working as a nurse, I fell on hard times due to my serious health condition and open heart surgeries. And I speak out today because I know that there are many like me and others experiencing the same thing. And Living is a great program and offers resources like home, home ownership programs and assisting moving forward with financial 
But reaching my goals through this program relies first on a landlord acceptance. Please vote yes to amend this city's fair housing audience to add source of income as a protected class. People like me cannot wait any longer and these for these protections. Thank you for hearing my struggle. Thank you, Ms. Hall Holt. Did I miss Mr. Griffin, Nicholas Griffin? Did I fail to um, have you speak, Mr. Griffin? Uh, I think you missed Greg Gerald. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I missed Mr. Gerald. Mr. Gerald. I am. Yeah. I apologize, Mr. Gerald. You please. That's all right. Uh, thanks. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Councilors. This is Reverend Greg Gerald from uh, QC Family Tree in Enderly Park, and also the co-chair of the Charlotte Clergy Coalition for Justice. Speaking uh, like others tonight about the source of income discrimination policy, as clergy, you might expect me to speak to the moral character of this debate as it relates to the of poor in our city. But the moral lines of this debate are already clear, as you have indicated yourselves, and you know them well. So instead, I want to br briefly relate to you my experience as a property manager here at Juicy Family Tree in our rentals to residents at 30% AMI and below. My experience includes working with Enlivian for a tenant who receives a housing choice voucher. Rather than being onerous or cumbersome, the experience is simple, the guidelines are clear, and the long-term benefits are significant. Turnover is low, and payments are consistent. The inspection process is easy. It simply requests that landlords bring housing up to minimum housing standards required in the city and state code. When problems occur, as they do in all houses and buildings, the remediation process is not punitive, but emphasizes the health and well-being of tenants. In this way, working with Enlivian is no different than meeting the minimum building standards required in every sector. The primary reason not to work with Enlivian or other public funders is the intention not to meet the minimum building code standards. Housing choice vouchers and other subsidies are evidence that the housing market is not like other markets. When the choice is hardware or breweries or cars, consumers can exercise the power of the purse to choose persons or companies that provide quality experiences and to withhold business from those who do not. But in a city with perpetual housing shortage, the absolute human need for shelter is not the same kind of market. Housing is a unique market and requires careful policy making. The decision to use policy to ensure that housing providers engage in good business practice of providing quality service for their customers is simple. It applies the principles of sound Thank business to the much, unique characteristics um, of the housing market. Thank you, Pastor Gerald. Okay, we're going to end with one of our most passionate speakers, Mr. McKinnon, Reverend McKinnon. I don't know whether to say Mr. or Reverend or Ray. All right, Mr. Ray, Reverend McKinnon. Move to close the public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. You have too uh, many member. friends, Ray. You just have too many friends. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. Uh, I am uh, Ray McKinnon, and I uh, join you today uh, as a... Um, uh, form as what? Uh, all right. I am a member of in Libyan, formerly Charlotte Housing Authority, and I was also uh, one of the inaugural members of the Leading on, to, on Opportunity Council. Uh, we know um, that all incomes count, and we know through surveys that many housing choice uh, voucher families would like to move to different uh, neighborhoods with higher opportunities, but they are unable to do so. We know. Uh, from our conversations with our family. Many are denied. We've heard it here tonight. We know that uh, housing providers deny vouchers uh, to our uh, folks who hold our vouchers every single day, and in so doing, it relegates them and their children to a limited number of census tracts here in Charlotte. And many of those tracts have higher rates of poverty. Uh, they are uh, segregated uh, by race. They are and they're adjacent to lower, for, lower performing schools. In the end, this prohibits com our community uh, integration and access to neighborhoods of higher opportunity, neighborhoods with lower crime rates and poverty rates, and, and uh, possibly better performing schools. Tackling matters of economic mobility is never easy, and it oftentimes is going to be controversial. These matters have always required audacious leadership. Madam Mayor and members of council, it is that audacious leadership we need today. We know that our members are waiting for us to do something. We can't do everything, but we can do something. Sometimes it requires a first action. We believe that you can take this action. We believe you must take this action. And kicking the, the can down the road 
cannot be the way. We know uh, a lot of committees are formed around here, but we already know we have done the work at Olivia. We have all the information. If you and Thank your you. staff want it, we're Thank happy to share that with you. Thank but you. the time to act is now. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. Of course, I think we have all of that information from the documents that have been presented to us. Um, you've heard that the council has um, asked the manager to provide a policy that for any um, project with public dollars that we um, ex require that there be non-discrimination of source of income. And then also to um, request, he is, the, the council has asked the manager to come back with a process for a um, task force made up of all of the constituencies of um, source of income discrimination to work on a collaborative effort that might influence this effort. So thank you very much for everyone that spoke on this issue tonight, as well as those citizens that addressed the issues of our work in the fire department, our potholes and streets. Homelessness is always a concern of many of our people in this community, and, and we so welcome things, people that care enough to advocate for their positions and interests that care for our greater community. So with that, we're going to go to our public hearing um, item on item 11 on our agenda, which is a public hearing on airport 2021 general airport revenue bond and bond anticipation notes. And our action is to hold a public hearing related to the issuance of revenue bonds not to exceed $500 million and revenue bond anticipation notes not to exceed $300 million. Madam Clerk, we have any speakers? We do not have any speakers. Motion to close the public hearing. All right. Second, Driggs. All right. Thank you, Mr. Eggleston. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. So to motion to close the public hearing. Um, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Ms. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Um, Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Mr. Phipps? Okay, we'll come back. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. All right, Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you. All right. The next item, um, we are going to the um, adopt item 13. I mean, I'm sorry, do you have a city manager's report tonight? No, no. No. I'll bet no. not. <laughs> Anyone want the manager to make a report on any subject that you like? No, I don't see any hands raised. All right. Yes. Our, <laughs> Okay, um, our next item is item 13, um, adopt a resolution to revise the code of ethics, the gift policy and disclosure requirements the, for the mayor and city council. Do motion I have adopt, in, Eggleston. We have a motion, Mr. Eggleston, is there a second? Second, second. All right, I've got, I think I heard the mayor pro tem first. Um, is there any discussion? Anyone um, that wish to have a comment on this? <laughs> Hearing no comments, um, any further discussion, we will go to um, approval of this motion, which is Mr. Eggleston. That was a pleasant surprise, yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. All right, we're moved to our business agenda to agenda to ratify an, an, an interlocal agreement for the violence interruption program. There are four act three actions under this um, item. Adopt a resolution ratifying an interlocal agreement between the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County for the contribution of 250,000 for Mecklenburg County for the violence and eruption program. B, authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute all documents necessary to complete the interlocal agreement. And C, adopt a budget ordinance appropriating 500,000 from the general operating fund. 
I'm sorry, 500 from the general operating fund, 250 from the city, and 250 from uh, Mecklenburg County to the neighborhood development grant funds. Do motion I have a motion? Adopt and authorize. Mr. Second, Eggles, Driggs. Mr. Driggs, thank you. Any discussion or comments? Hearing no discussion, all in favor of this motion, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. All right, item 15 is amend an interlocal water agreement with Mount Holly um, to adopt a resolution amending this agreement with the city of Mount Holly to accept flow into the Charlotte Water Sanitary Sewer System. Motion to adopt. Driggs, second. Eggleston. Driggs, make the motion. Eggleston, second. Um, I mean, make the second of that motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Council Member Eggleston on the motion? Yes. Council Member Graham? Yes. Council Member Johnson? Yes. Council Member Newton? Yes. Council Member Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Council Member Ajmira? Yes. Council Member Phipps? Yes. Council Member Winston? Yes. Council Member Bakari? Yes. Council Member Driggs. Yes. Thank you. Item 16 is the approved developer agreements with 2151 Hawkins LLC, Golden Nugget Association, Associates, no owner, and Novant Health for traffic signals for signal modifications and B, adopt a budget ordinance appropriating $169,063 in private development funds for signal installations. I'm going to ask the mayor pro tem to take this motion. I am on the board of Novant Health and would make sure that um, if, the ma if Mayor Pro Tem would just take the roll call and the motion, I would motion appreciate Motion to approve Driggs. and adopt, Eggleston. Second, Driggs. Okay, well, I'll go uh, with Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Uh, Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. And myself? Yes. Thank you very That's much, unanimous. Mayor Pro Tem. Motion passes. 17 is the decision on Oak Hill's property, adopt an annexation ordinance with an effective date of February 22nd to extend the corporate limits to include Oak Hill's property area properties and assign them to the adjacent city council district two. Do I have a motion? Motion to adopt. Do I have a second? second Driggs. All right. Any discussion? Hearing none on the motion for adoption, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Thank you. Item 18, adopt an annex ordinance with an effective date of February the 27th to extend the corporate limits to include Watermark at Mallet Creek area properties and assign them to the adjacent Council District 4. Do I have a motion? Motion to adopt. Second. Second. Mr. Driggs, thank you. Give Is there any Johnson. discussion? Her district. I'm sorry. I said give me the motion to Ms. Johnson. All right. Um, <laughs> clerk, please note that the motion was made by <laughs> Councilmember Johnson. Um, is there any discussion of this item? Ms. Johnson, did you have a discussion? Want to make a yeah. comment? No. Okay. So with um, no further discussion, all in, um, let's, I'm sorry, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. 
All right, item 19, adopt a resolution and close an alleyway off of Royal Coat parallel to East Moorhead Street. Is there a motion? To adopt. All right, Mr. Second, Ex Driggs. Driggs, second. Any discussion? Hearing Definitely no discussion. Not. I'm sorry. Okay. Hearing no discussion. Um, all in favor of the motion, uh, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Did I hear Ms. Iselt? I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Okay, tonight the council will make appointments to boards and commissions. The council members have voted by ballot and submitted them to the clerk earlier today or sometimes before today. And any nominee receiving six or more votes is automatically appointment, appointed. If no one receives six votes, the runoff is necessary and you'll be able to vote on that to determine the highest vote getter. I think we have one runoff to have. So I'm That's gonna correct. ask um, our deputy clerk to um, go through each one starting at item 20 and note those that we will have to go and have a vote. Okay, thank you so much, Madam Mayor. Um, for privatization competition advisory committee, we have two appointments for two year terms. Uh, Edwell Betty received seven votes. Uh, Jacob Gattinger received eight. Uh, for the transit service advisory committee, we have one appointment for a partial term in the local express service passenger category. Um, Connor Burden received three and Linda Webb received five. So this is where we will have to do the runoff. Should we go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment where we have the sure. made a decision and we'll come back to the service, Transit Services Advisory? Yes, so for the Zoning Board of Adjustments, two appointments for three-year terms as an alternative, uh, alternative members is uh, Radhunda Katha has six votes and Marshall Williamson has six as well. All right, so we have how many um, appointments for the transit services? One? It's and the one appointment. Getters. Can you give me their names again, Madam Clerk? Yeah, it's uh, Connor Burdon. Burdon? And Linda Webb. Linda Webb. Madam Mayor, Mayor can I change Webb. my vote to Linda Webb? I'm not sure if I voted for her, but if I didn't, I'd like to change the vote and see if we can decide that tonight. I think Connor only had three votes, so you got to get to six. That's no, correct. To, to, to Linda, she had five, I think. Yeah, so, uh, so um, Councilmember Jakes, you said you'd like to shift your vote over to Linda, is that correct? Uh, yes, I, I did think I okay. voted for the other candidate, and if I can that conclude this by voting for Linda, who I feel is also qualified, I'd like to do that. So how many votes does that give Linda? That gives her six votes. All right, so Linda Webb is that, has, receives that appointment. Thank okay. you, Mr. Driggs, for making that easy for us. Um, I believe that is the conclusion of our agenda for Motion tonight. To adjourn. Um, thank you all for coming in at three. Thank you Second. for the patience through zoning and all of these very tough decisions that are so meaningful. We have a motion to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Aye. Hi. Uh, okay.